OCB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Very good morning to you. Welcome along. It's Thursday morning and the longest week of all time. You're very welcome along to OTB AM. It's Jaron on with you all the way through until 10 this morning. We'd love to hear from you if you're a Liverpool fan who is now beginning to count the chickens that are not quite hatched just yet. Uh, if you're a Leicester City fan who's in a little bit of despair or indeed if you are a, a Kerry supporter who has happened to catch any of the latest episode of the football pod with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran and Tommy Rooney uh, where the first 20 minutes are just this amazing love song, a, a beautiful one note love song. That, that's not true, it's a symphony of love for the Kerry football performance at the weekend and I think it's time really that this show paid due deference to the quality of the football that we saw last week as essentially Kerry were crowned the team of this decade. It'll be the first decade of this new millennium that they'll have been the team of the decade and uh, you know. <laughs> I'm, uh, what a convoluted dig, what a convoluted way to get a dig. I was wondering where you were going with that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, they certainly weren't the team of the last decade. Like, no. they're, they're, they're one and one from the decades or of the, the 21st century. They're one and one. They, they, they won the first decade, they lost the second decade. And th you would have to say this group now are the natural successors to any of the previous great teams. Well, the thing is, Dublin already have an All-Ireland this decade, so they're already 1-0 down in, within the context of this 10 years. So they're up against it, and uh, they'll be up against it this Sunday. I just can't wait for people to start saying, oh, Kerry got way ahead of themselves. Uh, the, the, the hype down in Kerry was unbelievable. Uh, when Dublin inevitably win on Sunday, when in actual fact, if you just listen to the Paddy and Andy podcast, you might actually find the fact that the hype is being created from outside of the county. Uh, but there, uh, I mean, they were, they, the, the analysis is brilliant. Like, why Kerry were so good had something to do with Galway, but not as much as people are making out. This isn't just a, a Galway collapse. This was actually an excellent, considered, evolutionary performance from last year and previous years where... Although he scored 3-6, uh, they're not reliant on Clifford to score 3-6 to win the game. They would have won it had somebody else been at the end of those chances. Do we not need to be really careful, though, about saying that this was an evolutionary performance? Like, it isn't just yarrowing away your chances to say it, it was all down to Galway. It, it, it has to have been in big part down to it. Like, my point all week has been that we just don't know yet. I will, I will, happily, uh, I will happily accept that beating Dublin on Sunday would frank that form. Uh, from last week, and it would show that actually it was more down to Kerry than it was down to Galway until they play Dublin and, and until they get to see it. Thankfully, it's coming up immediately, and we get to see that that litmus test straight away. Until that happens, I'm just not sure you can confidently say, yes, a huge amount of what happened last week is, is down to Kerry. Now, I suspect it might be, but. Well, the, the analysis at least points to things that Kerry are doing that yeah. are different and a, a stylistic evolution that helped them to achieve what they achieved last weekend. And obviously, you know, part of it was that Goa didn't respond to that and didn't react to it in a way that other good teams will. So uh, maybe they'll only be done by the 10 points this weekend. Imagine, um, like that, that's never going to happen. But like the thing about those sort of changes is that they seem amazing at the start because they kind of are, because the opposition doesn't really know what to do with it at times. Now, it doesn't seem like it was... Uh, anything new in the history of GEA, but it was new in the context of what Kerry have been trying to do over the last couple of years. Just a little bit more direct, uh, a, a forward line that was full of more forwards, and a full forward line in particular that was full of more forwards. So a team will adjust to that, and if there is one team in the country who know exactly how to set up perfectly on a tactical level and play to the opponent's weaknesses, it is Dublin. So it's a br it's brilliant timing for this to come along because, in in fairness, we do get we do get to kill a lot of this nonsense from from last week about oh Kerry are the best team in the country or oh Galway are the worst team in the country. The the reality is that it's somewhere in the middle, and Sunday will give us a great indicator as to where exactly in the middle it lies. Yeah, and if you look back as well at any of the books or any of the interviews that have been done, league matches between these two teams, they matter. They, they're like a real opportunity that is rare enough for them to try stuff out or to see who goes well against somebody else. So isn't it various league matches that um, the Kerry selectors have realised that Jack Barry does yeah. weirdly particularly well against Brian Fenton? Like, it, it's not, there's not nothing riding on this in, in the way that everyone's like, ah, she's not the league, it doesn't matter at all. It matters on a million different levels if the analysis is good enough to point out why it matters and, and what we should be looking for. 100%. The, these games in the league have been crackers over the last few years, and there have been a, a couple of occasions where Dublin have won 
by six or seven points. But then there have been a couple of occasions in the championship when Dublin have won by six or seven points. I think maybe one in every four games between them, Dublin will show the gap between them. And then on the other three occasions, it's a draw or a very close victory one way or the other. So that's representative of the championship form. So I agree that this Sunday will be a real indicator. You listen to any of the dubs that talk about the resurgence at the start of the last decade. They always go back to that game in Killarney in 2010 in the league, which was such a massive win for them. And I think nothing has changed on that front since then. I think maybe it's taken Kerry a few years to realise that the league is now important for a multitude of reasons. But now they're both there. They both really want to win on Sunday. Also, there's just no time for arsing around this year and to pretend, oh, we're peaking at the right time or we're, we're just keeping our powder dry. There's just no point overthinking it. The, the season is too short. And as Kerry realised last year, life is too short to be thinking about that sort of thing. It's 7.36 this morning. We're going to talk a little bit about football uh, later on. We'll get into the... We'll play a clip, indeed, of uh, the new Football Pod, episode two from uh, the Football Pod with Paddy and Andy. You can subscribe to that on the OTB Sports app, and uh, we'd love, if you're an iTunes user, if you would uh, rate that and uh, give it the all five stars and leave a comment. And uh, Tommy will read it out on the air next week because some of the questions have been pretty good so far. Uh, the other thing that we need to talk about is Big Sam. Um, I, I, is this the end of Big Sam in the Premier League? I mean, if you look at... If you look at Roy Hodgson talking about wanting to get back into management and he's 73, Big Sam could easily go on until he's 73. Now, I suspect that the fitness regime of uh, Roy Hodgson is, is more um, Spartan than the fitness regime of Big Sam, but who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe Big Sam has the, the staying power to come back again and take somebody else down in the relegation merry-go-round, or maybe he'll bring West Brom back up, I don't know. And, and that'll be his, his final uh, tour. But he's not going down without a few swings. That's for sure. Last night, in the aftermath of the game against West Ham, uh, Michael Antonio alluded to the way West Brom play, it being quite rudimentary. I think every player likes to throw that out about West Brom, where they say, oh, it was tough, our back, like our, their backs were up against the wall. And they don't necessarily mean it as some sort of psychological dig on the philosophy of the manager. But Sam Allardyce seemed to have taken it as such, and he had a right pop off on Antonio afterwards. What did he call it? Disgusting, was it? The, the uh, exact adjective he used to describe the, the particular assault on their style of play. Uh, like, I mean, they have knocked the ball around nicely at times this season. He might point to the fact that they beat. Uh, Thomas Tuchel's Chelsea in such comprehensive fashion uh, earlier on this calendar year. But he does also say in his post-match interview, Sam, that they did use those tactics against Liverpool and that Liverpool got unbelievably lucky and there is a, a place for them in the game. But I think his overarching point, and uh, I think Antonio's been caught in the crossfire here a little bit, is that Big Sam gets a hard time. And Big Sam came out to tell everybody that Big Sam gets a hard time. And I just wonder if Big Sam is talking about the time when he got the hardest time, uh, the, 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 that moment when he lost his dream job as, as manager of the England team. I just wonder if that's actually the subtext to everything that Big Sam says when he is coming out to fight for his own honour. He has, has certainly been hardened in a, in a lot of his views, which I'm sure an experience like that can do to you. But yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what what he, what he does next because there was, like, there was an expectation this year that he would keep West Brom up and then all of a sudden he's right on the, the, the positive trajectory again. Michael Antonio says uh, it was a massive win. They came out and played some free-flowing football. Big guys hitting the channels. You know how Sam always plays. But we came here and dug deep, went 1-0 down but managed to come back and get clear. Doesn't seem that controversial, does it? No. Big guys hitting the channels. You know how Sam always plays but we came here and dug deep. Went 1-0 down, but managed to come back and get clear. Big Sam. Unlike Michael Antonio's statement that I just heard before, he came out here and said, we've got big men who play in the channels. He just insulted me and my team. I know he's a nice lad, but it was disgusting what he said. I think he should go back and watch the game and see how we really played. Our front two are 5'10 and 5'9. So I don't know what big men he saw running the channels. Uh, the two lads who play for West Brom are probably, I don't know, they might be six feet, but they're certainly like, here, listen, it's five foot nine and a half, okay? Okay, Sam? Yeah, like, I mean, it's, it's like, thanks a million. Like, it's um, Hal Robson Canoe and Mateus Pereira, I presume, who he's, he's talking about. Uh, and then he gets asked about being um, a saviour for relegation threatening clubs. That's what I've been for the last six or seven years, because that's all you lot ever talk about. Just like Michael Antonio just said, it's Sam with long ball. It's Sam with the way he plays. It's a load of crap. And it's always been a load of crap because I've never played the same way at any club I've ever been at. If you thought that was long ball today, then somebody is deluded. 
Yeah, like, I mean, it's an element of his type of football that he plays rather than necessarily what they would have done last night. People get, always, people get very tetchy about any sort of criticism of, of their style. It, it's just strange that he, he's picked Antonio, he's picked this moment to have this pop back. I, I genuinely, as I say, I think it's just a coincidence that, it, that it's Antonio. It could have been anybody. It could have been... Uh, he, he was looking to pick a fight last night, and I'd say this is something... There's been a bit of a bee in his bonnet for a while, like the constant criticism yeah. of, uh, of how he approaches football. Big Sam's Bolton played JJ Okocha in the team and weren't actually a long ball team. Like, you know, I'm, he says, uh, we played long ball against Liverpool because it was the right way to play and should have got a result against them, they didn't like it. It showed everybody, if you play a simple game against Liverpool, you can get at them, you can get behind them, and you can get chances. They were lucky to beat us tonight, dead lucky. Today, West Ham didn't deserve to beat us 3-1, but that was our fault, not anybody else's. So he's obviously raging. I mean, I'm fairly ambivalent about Big Sam. Sometimes you think he gets a, a raw deal, and then other times you remember some of the things he's done. It, it will be interesting to see what happens if he does take a championship job. Championship, obviously, is the division that's got pretty advanced over the last few years where this team's playing really nice football, getting promoted. There is, though, a team every now and then, and then that comes up based on a bit of pragmatism. That's, like, it's a bit of a shame almost from West Brom's perspective that they don't have Big Sam around next year. It would have been interesting to see what he could have done with them in the championship, which probably would have come which probably would have resulted in coming close to promotion at the at the very least. But, uh, yeah, like I, it, it's just a, this interesting time where the Premier League has certainly moved into a phase where long ball tactics and playing it through the channels has evaporated a little bit and the championship has kind of moved that way as well. But then maybe the more it moves away from it, the more effective that long game actually becomes. I think that there's definitely something in that and I think that uh, zigging what everybody else sags, if you're going to be one of those teams like West Brom, then there might be something to that. So 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number. If you want to get in touch with us this morning, you can always leave a comment on the YouTube stream. You can get us on Twitter, at Off The Ball. You can get us on Instagram, at Off The Ball. We are pretty much everywhere that you want to be. And if there's anything you'd like to uh, get off your chest or talk to us about, then feel free to do so. One other big rivalry that we need to talk about, not just Kerry Dublin, is the Lakers against the Warriors. It's um, LeBron versus Steph. They played last night in not quite a one-and-done game. I don't really understand how the end of the NBA season is working here on, so maybe you could drop some wisdom bombs on us. You, yeah, it's kind of like two-and-done, uh, if that makes sense. This, there are two play-in games in the West, and the Warriors and the Lakers took part in the higher-seeded play-in game. So the winner's not going home, uh, or the loser's not going home, but the winner is going straight to the playoffs, so that's the benefit there. So the and Lakers... Normal playoffs, like a best of five for the, in the best next of seven. round? Is yeah. that, they're all play best of seven, okay, okay. All be yeah, it, it used to be. It was better probably in the best of five days in the first round, but it's best of seven now. So uh, you've got to feel sorry for the Phoenix Suns this morning. They have worked their ass off all season long. They've built on a brilliant playoff run, or play-in run, I should say, at the end of last season. They've got a Devin Booker... Uh, who's a phenomenal young talent, and they've come second in the West. Their reward for coming second is to play LeBron James and the Los Angeles Lakers because they came out on top last night against the Golden State Warriors. And it was this incredible game. It was this game that is going to go down in folklore immediately. You kind of know that straight away. This has happened so much when LeBron and Steph Curry go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Some of those Cleveland-Golden State games were incredible over the course of the last five years. So the moment of lore that comes from last night is that this is probably going to be known as the eye game. So uh, LeBron James uh, is going up for a layup, I think, and we can see it here on screen where uh, Draymond Green leaves a hand in on the face oh. of uh, LeBron James. Uh, and uh, as we can see, he, his eye is not in an amazing shape uh, immediately thereafter. So he's poked in the eye, he's asked about it afterwards, and he says, after the finger to the eye, I was seeing three rims and shot at the middle one. By grace, I was able to knock it down. Uh, there he is on the ground. Uh, by knocking it down, he is talking about the game-winning shot, which came with a minute left on the clock. It was right up against the shot clock buzzer. We've got an image of where he was when he took the shot. Uh, ball comes out from Caruso, I think, where basically the Lakers have completely screwed up an attack. LeBron gets the ball from 36 yards, 30, knocks it down over Steph Curry's head. As you can see, it is uh, the longest shot that LeBron James has made all season. On the buzzer, as I say, with the shot clock, commentary team goes wild, camera pans to Drake and Michael B. Jordan in the crowd. It's like, this is the Lakers at it again, and they qualify for, for the playoffs. 22 points, 11 rebounds, 10 assists. It was a triple-double 
last night and they're true as I said at Phoenix Suns this Sunday it's a good time for an Irish audience as well you might be watching the golf on Sunday but at half eight it's going to be game one in that series for Golden State Warriors as we say they're not out yet so they play the winner of the bottom seeded play in games which is the Memphis um, Grizzlies and they will be looking at Steph Curry through their fingers basically because they only played each other last Sunday and Steph Curry scored 46 points against them last Sunday so how on earth they're going to be able to stop them in a couple of nights time again remains to be seen so you'd give Warriors every chance of winning that and uh, and getting into the playoffs themselves so that'll set up uh, a, a, a clash with the Utah Jazz then in the playoffs for them so and who, who's expected to reach the finals at this stage the Clippers are the team that I would pick from the West at this point that being said you look at if I had to pick the semi-finals at this point it will be the Clippers versus the Jazz on one side in the West and on the other side it'll be Denver versus the Lakers which is going to be this incredible clash because you've got Nikola Jokic the best player form wise in the NBA right now who killed everybody in the race for MVP versus LeBron James I know Steph versus LeBron was class but Jokic versus LeBron is going to be on a is whole level of young that. or mid twenties at this point. Okay, so kind of like he's he's just crested over the last last few seasons to to kind of like uh, in, in this generation of of incredible foreign imports into the NBA like Giannis and Co that are just killing it every season. We have some LeBron audio here. This is him talking about his game winning three and the eye poke to ESPN. Got to talk about that shot you hit with about a minute left. The three, you didn't even look in rhythm there. What were you thinking as the ball left your hands? Um, you know, just, um, you know, I put in a lot of work in my game. You know, um, you know, after, you know, drape my uh, finger to the eye, I was literally seeing three, uh, three rims out there. Um, so I just shot at the middle one. And, uh, and I was able to, uh, to the grace of the man above, I was able to knock it down. When in doubt, go for the middle yeah. rim. What did it feel like when you were down there on the floor when you took that hard fall? Were you worried that you wouldn't be able to continue in the game or have more problems? See? Um, you know, uh, I've been there before. Um, you know, I've been poked in the eye before, you know, on a, on a rim collision like that. So just try to keep my composure. You know, it's going to be pretty sore tonight. I know that for sure. Um, but we have a few days until we, do, until we know uh, when we'll go to Phoenix. But it's a big time win for us, and I definitely wasn't leaving the floor no matter if I had to. Uh, you know, uh, put a pirate uh, patch on my eye. So uh, I love this team and I love to compete. Exactly. This is getting interesting because obviously he hates the Warriors. I mean, the Warriors essentially stopped him being the most winning, greatest basketballer of all time because they, they were in their pomp when he was in his peak and could have won another couple. Yeah, it also kind of uh, solidifies LeBron, though. I mean, the 2016 finals when uh, the Warriors had won 73 games in the regular season, the greatest regular season of all time. LeBron beat that team in the playoffs. So he kind of has used the Warriors to enhance his legacy. But Draymond is just a shithouse. And uh, for him to be the man who poked him in the eye is fitting. Uh, it's going to be a great playoff series because uh, the Lakers are just down so low. They'll have to do it the hard way to get to the finals. OTBAM live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Here's what's coming up between now and 10 a.m. live on the show. It's 7 48. We've got Garth Roberts standing by. We're going to talk to him about the uh, situation with Liverpool and uh, how close they are to qualifying for the Champions League. Brian Maher is going to join us to talk to us about raising money for Special Olympics. We've got our Euro cheat sheet. We're doing the rest of Group A today. Uh, James Scale is going to join us for the first time this season to talk to us about Cork's puck out strategy and why it's not all bad. We've got John Duggan on the sports news at the start of the PGA. We've got golf with John Malloy. TV with Sue coming a little bit later on. And Philippe Auclair is going to talk to us about... Um, Karim Benzema coming back to the France squad, why it makes sense from a football perspective, but why football isn't the only thing, as we know, with French football squads at major tournaments. So it's a, a fairly tangled and nuanced story, and we'll get into that with Philippe around about half past nine this morning. Now, I'm delighted to say Gareth Roberts of the Anfield Rap is with us. Gareth, good morning to you. How are you doing? Good morning, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, look, I'd say there was a period of time when it was nil all last night, and uh, Burnley were creating pretty good chances that you were biting your fingernails. Yeah, a little bit, um, albeit that it was early on in the game um, and I was fairly confident in how Liverpool were playing that we were going to be all right. I wasn't I wasn't too bad. I don't think it was... It wasn't... After watching a situation unfold where we were re relying on our goalkeeper to score with a header in the game before, um, I was fairly all right in this one, to be honest. Liverpool were creating chances, albeit not putting them away. I thought Thiago was pulling the strings in midfield from early on. And yeah, James Wood was giving um, our defenders some problems there, but he gives most defenders some problems, it's fair to say. He's in good form. 
And look, you know, we st- we we've, we've got we've still got five central defenders out injured. Um, so when when it's a, a, a makeshift pair and at the back, I think you've got to expect other sides to cause you some problems, and that's been the case. But Liverpool going the other way now look more like the real deal to me. The the Thiago signing was such a moment of excitement for Liverpool fans. It's kind of hard to remember back to that whole pre-COVID time. But are we finally beginning to see the whole point of having Thiago in the squad and in the team for matches like last night where, as the commentators were saying, it, it, I think my name is Carrier, look, it's 2-0. These, these are the games where you want him just to come in and kill the game by just controlling it and slowing it down and making it so annoying for the opposition that it's impossible for them to get the ball. And, and that was that's different from the go, go, go uh, heavy metal football that Klopp had had the previous couple of seasons. Yeah, absolutely. We are starting to see uh, why he was brought in. Um, I think he's starting to, to really settle. I think he's part of a system now as well. I think collectively Liverpool are playing a lot better now. And certainly the last three games, I think you've really seen what Thiago's... Well, three or four games, actually, you, you, you're seeing what Thiago's all about. He's bossing midfield, he's pulling the strings. But also he's doing what he wants to do. I think one of the problems has been during the, the darker times of this season, if you like, he turned into almost a defensive midfielder, a, a job in midfielder, a man running around putting tackles in all over the pitch. And that's obviously not his game. I mean, it become a bit of a running joke with Liverpool about, you know, what, what time on the clock would it be when Thiago picks up his yellow card? Because it seems to be every game. Now, he's being asked to do less of that now, and he's being asked to do more of what he's actually skilled at, which is controlling the game, pulling the strings, finding the passes, keeping the ball and all of those sorts of things. And he was unlucky not to score last night as well. So it, it's exciting now, I think, with Thiago. You're starting to look to the future and say, well, imagine when everyone's fit. Imagine when Virgil van Dijk's behind them. Imagine when Henderson's fit. Imagine when the first choice midfield is starting. We can, we have fingers crossed. I think we will see a lot more from him then. But as I say, he was being asked to do stuff he was clearly not comfortable doing. Um, it wasn't a great time for Liverpool as a collective as well during that time. And I thought it was a little bit over the top when, you know, certain journalists and, and what have you jumped on board and started saying, well, why have Liverpool bought him? There's no assists, there's no goals. There is a goal now, of course. And, you know, I, I just think the culture of digging players out early on into their c- careers when they move country or move club, we, we should really move away from it because, you know, it, that happens sometimes. So it takes, some, it takes some players a little bit longer to start to shine at a new club, but... He's, there, he's certainly starting to shine at Liverpool now, no, no doubts about that. I'm also interested in, in where the perception is of, of how the season has been managed by Klopp. Obviously, if they qualify for the Champions League, you're going to point to all of the injuries. Of course you are, and particularly the importance of Virgil, because we saw how, how much of a transformative uh, presence he was on the field, and also he seems to be kind of quite transformative and important off the field too. But yeah. given how well... Nat Phillips played last night. Obviously, it's man of the match, and there's a goal line clearance, and he scores a goal. And obviously, he, it, this is the best he's performed in his career. Would it have been better in retrospect? You know, if you if you could get in a time machine, would you tap Klopp on the shoulder and say, "Listen, don't pick Fabinho and don't pick Henderson in defence. Stick them in midfield because it's going to completely destabilise your whole season. Stick Nat Phillips in, give him five or six games, get him up to speed, and let's let's see where the the cards fall at that point." In retrospect, was it the wrong decision to play the midfielder as a centre-back? I think it's a little bit hindsight analysis, that, to be honest. I understand why people are saying it. And look, you know, Nat Phillips has, has punched far above his weight, uh, probably by his own admission as well. But equally, I think if you're watching Liverpool on the regular, um, you will see that, you know, for all the times that he's clearing off the line and now scoring a goal, and it's a brilliant story around them. He's punched way above his weight, as I say. You know, he's not a player that when everyone's fit at Liverpool is going to be playing on the regular. In fact, there's a case to be made that, you know, while his stock is as high as it is for him and the good of the club, it might be it might actually be a time to move. Um, now, some people are getting emotionally attached to him and saying, well, I can't believe you're saying things like that after what he's done. And I get that. And if he wants to stick around and be sort of fourth, fifth choice at the club at centre-half, then there's a case to be made for that too. But... There's a reason Klopp went with those players at, at, at centre-half, and that is because he believed they were better than what, what was left, basically, at, down at six choice at, at centre-half, which is what, basically, Nat, Will, Nat Phillips and Reese Williams are. Um, so I, I don't know about that, really, to be honest with you, about the idea of, of, of rolling it back. We, 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 had, we had bodies in midfield. We were able to play 
players in midfield who played regularly in midfield. And what you're saying to me now is, do you think you know Klopp should have played a player, two players, and in fact at times there, who've who've hardly ever at all played for the first team. And in fact, in that Phillips case, as we as we now all know well, you know half the Championship wanted to sign him last season, and and he was on his way. He, he was going to go to Swansea and things like that. So you know the football world had decided that his level was sort of mid-table Championship, and I don't think that's disparaging to Nat Phillips. That's where he was at. He's come in, done a good job, found his confidence, done a lot better than a lot a lot of people would have expected. But let's go back to what Klopp said about him when he when he first came into the side a few times. He said himself along the lines of I was a limited player who had passion for a side and that is something similar he said something like that and I don't think anyone battered an eyelid at the time um, but now of course after a series of you know more than decent performances as I say now topped with a goal as well I think people are looking at the results looking at the performance and perhaps need to temper it a little bit about what this means about his future because I still think as I say you know, his stock is now really, really high and it may be that a lot of clubs fancy him going and signing for them. We've got Van Dijk, Matip, Gomez to return for definite. We still don't know what's going to happen with Kabak. We're probably going to sign Canate. You know, it's going to be hard for him to be playing on the regular in this Liverpool side. He's 24. You know, he's not he's not a rookie. Um, and it may be that there's a, a side in the Premier League now that would now take him for good money for Liverpool for good money for him in terms of wages and offer him regular first team football and I would I would argue there's a good argument to say in that circumstances Nat should probably go and take that opportunity OK let's move on because I'm interested in what you think the, the team needs then to to keep pace with Manchester City at the top of the table next year That's let's face it that is absolutely going to be the target we, we understand that they're in the market for a, a new striker although Guardiola has been talking about Ferran Torres perhaps being there uh, number nine in succession to Sergio Aguero and heaven knows if they actually need one but what do Liverpool need to add to the squad and how many first team players do you think they could actually buy over the summer? I mean we obviously need to buy that another centre half as already discussed and, and, and it's expected to be Canate. Uh, Van Aldum is obviously on his way out uh, you know barring some kind of massive U-turn and miracle really on his contract so he he will be missed um, more often not than not, uh, Klopp will turn to him when he's fit. He's played virtually every game in the league since he's been here. Uh, very reliable, um, an international footballer and, a, and a, a versatile international footballer. So he, he will be missed. Um, I've just said about Thiago. Obviously, you know he's come in. He's now at a pace for being a Liverpool player. I would say. I mean, I think the big thing. Yes, there will be signings. How many? I don't know because I think a lot of it will be dependent on what Liverpool can shift out um, and, and it remains to be seen how depressed the transfer market is given everything that everyone's gone through because obviously a lot of revenue has been lost for all clubs across the league and so I think it's very easy to sit down with a, a notepad and a, a notepad and a, pe a pen and say well you know Divock Origi should move on because he's not got regular team regular first team football you could make the case for Shaqiri moving on you could say Naby Keita hasn't worked out you could even say, you know, Chamberlain's not had a lot of a lot of minutes, and, and there's a maybe an argument to say he moves on. Although I really enjoyed his cameo and his goal last night, and I think he's he struggled, he's frustrated, but he's got he's still got quite a bit of time left on his contract. So I think the big thing is getting back players back fit and firing, and then obviously adding to that on top. I'd expect a midfielder to come in, I'd expect a defender to come in, and I think there is an argument still. Even though uh, you know Jot is injured currently, uh, along with everyone else, um, but I still think there's maybe an argument for an out-and-out -out goal scorer to be there as an option. Because uh, as I say, I would expect a Rigi to move on, and someone to come in better than a Rigi basically would be, would be a big boost for Liverpool in terms of keeping on the the coattails of City or keeping up with City or doing even better than City. I think it's worth remembering that for all that this has been a nightmare season for Liverpool. Last season, Manchester City finished 18 points behind Liverpool at the end of the season. Liverpool are currently 17 points behind Man City. So it is possible to turn things back around again the other way. And, you know, the injuries have been unbelievable. I know people don't want to talk about it or bored of it, think it's an excuse. But, you know, to have 
so many injuries in one one position and for those injuries to to be continuing so i mentioned jota now is now missing although there is an outside chance he could maybe play at the weekend apparently but you know it's been unbelievable this season and and it's affected liverpool more than any other club I don't, you know I'm, I'm sure that'll get clipped and someone will say no 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 and, and offer me some evidence the other way but there's plenty of people who support Liverpool producing evidence putting it in front of me to say Liverpool have actually had you know the worst deal on injuries in the top flight this season so I'm more inclined to believe them to be honest so that's the first thing that needs to happen get these players fit, fit and fire and it, it's a boost to Liverpool that Van Dijk is not going to the Euros and is going to try and stay here, get fit and be ready for the new season. That that will be absolutely huge, as you've already mentioned. Add some signings on top, and I'm more than hopeful that Liverpool can be back up where they should be next season. Like there is a strong argument, Gareth, that Liverpool are the best team to grab onto the coattails of Manchester City because there have only been two teams who have proven that they can do 95 points in back-to-back -back seasons. And if you look at that squad, things haven't changed overly for Liverpool. As you say, Juan Alden will be the change ahead of next year, but the net gain may actually exist if, you, if Thiago actually kicks on properly next season so there is a, a real case to be made that it's actually Manchester United and Chelsea that need to strengthen in order to, to catch Manchester City whereas Liverpool almost have the parts there if they can get back to some semblance of last season's form. Yeah I think so I think you're right in that you know these players that have been out injured they're used to playing for Liverpool they're used to the system they don't need to be coached in terms of how it's all going to work you would expect if they can reach their own personal levels again, that they can then slot in and work with the rest of the team. You know, any signings that other teams make need that bedding in period that I talked about before. So, you know, there's a bit of an unknown factor there, whereas players that we've missed through injury, you know, fingers crossed, touch wood, that they're coming back at a similar level to what they once were, because uh, you never know, of course, with injuries. But let's say that they do then I think there's every reason to say Liverpool can click again, turn into the results machine they were once before and start, you know, clocking up the kind of form that takes them all the way to the top of the table. I mean, you know, I, I look at how this season's gone and we were as low as eighth not so long ago. Now we've got every chance of finishing fourth and getting in those Champions League spots. I think that's massive for, for morale, um, for, for how the team feels about the new season, including the manager. Mm. And, and I think, you know, the manager, there's been a lot of debate I've seen in the media about what the manager said about, you know, it would, what an achievement it would be to get in the Champions League. Now, I get how that can be torn apart. I get how you can say, they were champions, though, and now they're not. How can he be big enough getting into the Champions League? But I think, given the adversity around injuries, around personal tragedies, around the form, around the psychological rut they were in at one point with, with certainly with the home results at that stage where they had, you know, whatever it was, six in a row defeats. Um, I think to turn it back round and be in a situation where the, the, they are now the form team in the league and they just have to be Crystal Palace and then they are in the Champions League again, that is a big feat. It's not better than winning the league. It's not better than winning the European Cup. Of course not. But I think Jürgen's got to sell that message internally to the players. You have done fantastic to turn this around. And I think with, with some of the things that have gone on, like the madness of Alisson's goal, with Nat Phillips scoring last night, even with Oxlade Chamberlain scoring last night, you're getting some like feel-good stories around Liverpool now. And the way they're celebrating and you look at the faces, the smiles on the faces again, you can tell that mentally they've turned things around. So... We get these players back and I think there's every opportunity for Liverpool to be right up there again next season. And and I think you're right to say there, by the way, that you know there are question marks over other clubs. So, you know, how will other clubs perform in normal times? You know, Manchester United have been phenomenal away from home. Um, not so at home. You know, their home record is comparable to Liverpool's. Um, you know, they they are they've taken thirty one points from nineteen games at home. Liverpool have taken thirty from eighteen. Um, now, you know, th there is a broken record about Liverpool having horrendous home form this season. Manchester United have only won one more point. Liverpool have got one more game to play at home. So, can all these things, will all these things unfold again next season? Will, will Manchester United be in second place next season? Will Liverpool be in fourth or as low as eighth? I don't think so on any of that. Well, looking forward to having uh, full stadiums for sure. Gareth, great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. Cheers, fellas. Thank you. Gareth Roberts of the Anfield Wrap giving us some thoughts on the Liverpool situation. Five minutes past eight this morning here on OTBAM. We'd love to hear from you. 087 9180 180 is the WhatsApp number.
and you can get in touch with us a bunch of different forms. Uh, OTBAM live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, give you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. We've got James Scale talking hurling, we've got Joe Malloy talking golf, we've got a Euros cheat sheet and we'll be right back after this. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Joey, boy, don't be tense and say it with me here. I was breaking it. Have you subscribed to the OTB Rugby podcast? If not, here's some of what you've missed in the last week. The referee was absolutely shocking. Peter Mandy couldn't speak to him towards the second half, so CJ Sander ended up talking to the referee because Peter just was like, I can't. Like, that's your captain. You can't do that. Subscribe now to the OTB Rugby podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts or get the entire OTB catalogue on the OTB Sports app. First up, a Go Loud original from News Talk. Get all the news you need to start your day with First Up, the podcast that brings you stories, analysis, and interviews with the top newsmakers. First Up, available each weekday morning from 7 a.m. on Go Loud. Subscribe to this podcast for free on the Go Loud app. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna automower. Automower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. Have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Automower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie OTB AM With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. It is seven minutes past eight this morning. You're very welcome along to OTBM. If you've just joined us, you've missed Gareth Roberts from the Anfield Wrap. Now, I want to talk about uh, something special that's happening in the Phoenix Park today. Brian Maher from 98FM's Big Ride Home is at it again. He set himself another mammoth challenge, a 24-hour run-a-thon to raise money for Special Olympics Ireland. Brian, good morning to you. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thanks, Emil. Yeah, just arrived over here at the Hole in the Wall at the Phoenix Park, so uh, the countdown is on. What time are you starting? Uh, starts just after 9 a.m. So that's the plan, 9 a.m. And then uh, keep going every hour for 24 hours. So when people are uh, eating their dinner tonight, you're going to be running. When people are in bed tonight, they're going to be running. When yeah. when people are getting up tomorrow morning, you're still going to be running. Still running. Still running. I was actually, I've been thinking about even going to bed last night. You know, I, 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 I went to bed just after 11, I would say. And I was like, God, I wouldn't, I'd only be just past kind of the halfway point. You know what I mean? So, uh it is it, when you when you think about it hour by hour by hour, it does get slightly more momentous. <laughs> <laughs> this is like uh, just dawning on you right now, Brian. What you've signed up for? <laughs> yeah, I like even I've gone out for training runs, you know. And when I map out the runs, so if it's an eight-hour run or a twelve-hour run, and I map it out, and I think, yeah, okay, that's fine. I'll be finished by this time. And about you know, kind of three quarters the way in, I'm like, well, maybe I'll just call it a day there for this training session but uh you're only cheating yourself doing something like that so yeah it's about having people around me some friends and that who've previously done some um long distance runs with me will be helping me out through the night and you know kind of doing the radio as well will just keep my head kind of away from just constantly thinking about running every hour um so you're trying to raise money for special olympics ireland 24 grand in 24 hours that's your target I'd love to raise, yeah, I'd love to raise 24 just to go along, obviously, with the theme of running for 24 hours. For me, personally, it would be a big goal because if I raise around 24, 25,000 over the course of the last four previous challenges I've done for Special Olympics, that will raise my total to 100,000 raised for them. So um, that is my target. Hopefully, we're doing pretty well. You know, I've over five grand raised already before even setting foot inside the Phoenix Park. So uh, people have been very generous. 98fm.com forward slash donate is where people can donate. This isn't the first bit of craziness you've done, Brian. What what is there in what is the strain of madness that exists within you that has a desire <laughs> to run or swim or, or do something for longer than it seems like humans can do? Well, at the core of it, to be honest, I'm probably actually a very lazy person. I know you don't you won't believe me when I say that, but if I don't have something to aim for in the distance, I just won't do it. So if it's something that doesn't scare me into having to train for it as well, uh, again, I'll just go light on it. So, you know, I know I can do a 5K, 10K, no problem. And in fact, even like a marathon to me, I 
would take on a month's notice. So now I need to keep thinking up all these things. My wife hates me for it. Um, and she was constantly asking me, would this be the last one? But sorry, I can't promise you just yet. Right. What else have you done? Uh, I've done I, my first challenge for Special Olympics was five marathons in five days. And then the following year, I ran from Limerick to Dublin nonstop. So it was just over 130 miles. Um, I cycled as well, the same distance, kind of keeping up that theme. And then I swam from Poolbeg Lighthouse across Dublin Bay to the 40 foot uh, a couple of years ago. How was that swim? That was horrendous. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't be a great swimmer, to be honest. Um, I had been training a little bit for triathlons and I was trying to work towards an Ironman at some stage, but um, I just couldn't get the training together. So I just focus on one of the aspects, which was the swim, but I did it in October of 2018. And uh, the water, I think, was like four degrees or something like that. It was uh, not a very pleasant day, as today is not a very pleasant day. I have a, have a habit of picking them. It's been sunny all week. for It's been dry for about I know. five weeks. And today it's lashing and windy. <laughs> I know, it's typical, yeah. And I've been looking at that app, you know, just constantly thinking they they have to be getting this wrong. It can't, it doesn't make sense. But yeah, no, lo and behold, they got it right today. Unfortunately, I'm looking at the window here at the water streaming off the top of the roof. Um, so it's it's going to just add to the uh, challenge, yeah. What's, well, the, what's the training been like, Brian? Um, it, it just building up steady. I actually, I, I tore the ligaments in my ankle at the beginning of lockdown last year. So I was, I was kind of rehabbing that for a long time. And once I started getting back up running again, then I thought to myself, maybe I could aim for something next year. So um, I've just been slowly building up, just kind of doing 5Ks every day up to, you know, 5Ks mixed with 10Ks, then doing some like long distance runs, four hour runs, six hours, eight hours, 12 hours. So uh, leading up to this point now, I'm feeling pretty, I'm feeling confident enough. It's just going to be one long day. Well, listen, we wish you the very best. It's an incredible achievement if you pull it off. I, I'm sure you will. And uh, if anybody wants to donate, 98fm.com forward slash donate. Brian, best of luck and congratulations in advance. Cheers. I appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you so much. It's uh, Brian Marr from uh, 98fm's Big Ride Home, who is doing a 24-hour run in the Phoenix Park today to try and raise 24 grand. 98fm.com. 98fm.com forward slash donate is the place that you can give some money to it. Now, a reminder, OTBAM live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. We've started our Euros cheat sheet in Group 1. We did Italy and Turkey yesterday. Who have we got today? Oh, we've got Wales, uh, our favourite sporting nation. Uh, you know, our beloved people in Wales. Uh, we get on great with Wales. And please, can you tell us how you can be uh, such a success at football and uh, such a success at rugby at the same time? It is quite amazing. Uh, so the Six Nations champions obviously didn't qualify for the last major football tournament because of James McLean. They are back in the Euros for the second consecutive time, though, finishing behind Croatia, but beating Slovakia and Hungary to second spot in their qualifying group, conceding only six goals in the process. Euro 2016, which we'd all remember, was... Wales's first European finals and it was genuinely funny that they got further than England even though they lost to England in the group stages Hal Robson Cruyff as we saw on screen there got the freedom of the valleys after his goal against Belgium put them into the semi-finals and Robson Canoe performed another turn last year this time coming out of retirement to come back to Wales Chris Coleman was the manager back then. He's gone on to bigger and better things, like getting the lead role in Sunderland Till I Die. Robert Page is going to be their manager this summer. Ryan Giggs has obviously stood aside. And a big part of his job is going to be getting a tune out of Gareth Bale. He only scored two goals in qualifying, but hasn't scored since. Let's not forget that he scored a goal in every single group game at Euro 2016, so getting him on song is going to be key. The good news is that they played two of their group games in Baku, not a golfing stronghold. Finally, let's have a look at their home kit. I know nothing about what constitutes a good football kit, but I'm going to go ahead and say that that football kit is nice. And the away kit, let's have a look at that. My expert opinion on this is that it is nice and it is yellow. So there you go. That is Wales. There we go. Beautifully in 90 seconds. All yeah, right. Yellow for the daffodils. Is that what the yellow is coming from? I don't know, but they, those kits are cool. I have to they say, are nice. they are cool. And, you know, isn't it, isn't it exactly... The type of tournament that Gareth Bale will come alive. Is Gareth Bale currently fit? Is he's not playing much football? He's being well rested by Spurs. Very nice of them to pick up whatever portion of his salary they're picking up, and also to not be flogging him in advance of the Euros. It is very nice. I, I like my, my disclaimer on all the kits because we got a text in yesterday to say, "Why aren't we doing the kits?" I mean, it was a very valid point. My disclaimer is that 
I sometimes look at a kit before World Cup or Euros and I'm like, wow, that's lovely. And then I see on Twitter or I see in WhatsApp groups, everybody's like, that kit is horrible. So, um, yeah, you, you people, back yourself, Owen. You, you, people, you've got style. But people, no, I don't. But uh, people at home know, know that I, I don't have style. Um, like, but uh, I will, uh, at the same time, be giving my expert opinion on whether or not these, these kits are nice or not. Wales, nice kit. Okay, Wales in the same group as uh, Turkey, Italy and Switzerland. That's a tough group. It is, uh, it is certainly. Uh, so let's go through their form. Uh, they're, after qualifying, um, they went into Ireland's Nations League and won every single game, as you remember. Except, of course, for the one game they didn't win, which was a nil-all draw in Dublin. A brave performance from Ireland, uh, but they have been promoted on that front. Since then, they've lost to Belgium in World Cup qualifying, but they've beaten the Czech Republic in World Cup qualifying. And in between those games, they beat Mexico 1-0, who, at the time of that fixture, were ranked ninth in the world. Um, if we have a look through some of the key players, uh, Gareth Bale, who I've, I've obviously mentioned, outside of him, Aaron Ramsey is the name that probably comes to most people's lips immediately. He's had a poor season with Juventus. Juventus in general have had a poor, poor season. Talk that he could be let go for as little as £10 million this summer. There's actually talk that Liverpool are in the mix for him. Arsenal would certainly take him back, I think. Wales won't mind, though, that he's had a poor season because it looks like he's going to be fit going into this year's tournament, which is a big deal because the Welsh squad have been ravaged with injury. Joe Allen did his Achilles tendon early in the season. Now he's injured his hamstring. He hasn't played enough for Stoke all season. Ethan Ampadu, who's played mostly in midfield rather than centre-back for Wales, he's also injured. Um, like, I mean, he, he's going to be touch and go, if you listen to what Paul Heckingbottom has been saying over the last couple of weeks. And the same goes for Ben Davis. Uh, he's been injured since early April, and it's going to be very tight to see if he'll get back. Now, if he does get back, he will be playing on the left of a back three. This has been a tactical shift that Wales have made last November, where they've gone to a back three, and it's kind of worked wonders for them a little bit, because they've got a lot of high-energy players that a lot of people would say aren't necessarily high quality. That may be harsh, but you've got, you've got Connor Roberts on one wing, Nico Williams on the other wing, and it seems that Wales are getting the best out of those two players. We've got Daniel James in the front three as well, again, a lot of fast running from him, and it seems that being part of a front three is something that's getting the most out of him on an international level. The question is, tactically for them, is whether or not they're going to go with a false nine. Uh, now, Wales and Ireland share the same problem where number nines aren't exactly growing on trees in Wales either. They're struggling. They've been playing uh, a false nine in Harry Wilson, actually, at, at one point over the last few months. But Kiefer Moore would be the man who would fulfil the role if they're going to go for an out-and-out -out number nine. So it'll be interesting to see what they do on that front. Uh, you did say it was a tough group to call with regards to where they're going to finish in it. I can't really uh, tell, but I, if I had to predict, I would <laughs> say that they are going to finish third and not qualify for the, the knockout stages. It's very hard to tell about who's going to qualify or not from the third place teams, but I just think the difference between Turkey and Switzerland and Wales is so small that this will be one of the groups where only two teams are going to qualify, and I think Wales are going to miss out as a result of finishing third. OK, all right, that is the crack with that. We'll have our second Euros cheat sheet of the day a little bit later on in the show. If you've got any opinion on the Welsh football team, 0879 180 180. If you want to send them best wishes, for example, we'll happily we will. send them on to the, the Welsh. We, we do love the good Welsh sporting great stories. Not that good at golf, are they? No. For not. a sport they seem to love a lot. That's about all we have over them at the moment. 18 minutes past 8 this morning here on OTBAM 087 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. And a reminder, OTBAM live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. We want to turn our attention to hurling. And I'm delighted to say James Scahill is with us. James, good morning. How are you doing? Morning, James. Thanks for having me. Um, the go-away performance at the weekend against Limerick, a lot obviously made in the aftermath of John Kiley's comments and less of an opportunity really given that to actually talk about the quality of what we saw. Um, this is definitely one of those years where the condensed championship means that any confidence a team gets, any any partnerships that build up, any style of play that evolves quickly in the league, you should be able to catapult that into the championship. So with that in mind, Galway must be pretty happy with what they saw at the weekend. Yeah, like it was it was a funny type of game, you know. Like I, I suppose if you, I was watching it during the first half, and if I, if I didn't see the scoreboard, I would have thought Limerick were winner. You know, it's just that was the way the kind of the patterns of play were turning out. I thought. I thought Gareth Hegarty was running the mock in the first half, um, but nonetheless, like oh, we went in three, three, four points up at half time. They'd be pleasantly delighted, to be honest. Um, they needed to beat, they needed to beat Limerick. We played Limerick a couple of times over the last number of years and had them out, uh, not on top. So that was a good victory for Shane O'Neill to get, and it's great, it's great for momentum. I know, I suppose a lot of the, a lot of the, the newspaper lines that were in um, over the last couple of days were dominated by John Kiley's comments, and that's fair enough. 
Um, but uh, Shane O'Neill won't, <laughs> with respect, he won't care about that. He is two from two and he's sitting nicely in top of the league. It's kind of the perfect scenario where you beat the All-Ireland champions and everybody's talking about something that happened that either did or didn't happen and, and it's kind of largely irrelevant in the long run. But what is relevant is that you've found something that will give your team confidence the next time they come up against Limerick. Yeah, that's, that's huge. You know, I just said a moment ago, like, momentum is huge. You know, like you, you look at the, that's the league game this year. We played them last year, let's say, and the championship came out. It didn't, it didn't go well, let's say, that the Iron final in 2018. So we've, we've needed a victory against Limerick. You know, that was that was great for, I know it's momentum now, but come the championship, and I'm sure this, these two teams will cross again, that uh, go, we needed that victory to, to know that they can, they can get over the line in Limerick. Uh, which was most likely going to be a semi-final or final, I think. You mentioned the, the games over the last couple of years there, the, well, 2018 and, and last year. From being mm -hmm. inside in that Galway camp, was there a feeling that you guys were best placed to take down this Limerick machine because of the physicality that your guys had? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I suppose you look at the Limerick, the Limerick team, their stature. They're, they're, they're very, very well-built uh, built guys. And I, I would have thought to say why we were you know, contested with them over the last couple of years that Galway were best placed. You know, we we big guys, big stature, fit, strong people in every in every line of the field. They say when you match up Limerick and Galway, the matchups tend to prove prove, uh, prove very entertaining. Say, um, and it's the way the game has kind of gone at the moment. You know, Limerick have, have produced a new game over the last four or five years under John Kiley, and and it's it's everyone else's job to catch up. And I think Galway are the only team that can at the minute at the minute uh, Galway are the only team that can contest with them. From a tactical perspective, right, uh, it was interesting the um, Limerick worked the ball through the lines and the, so therefore there's more physical exchanges and so therefore there are more frees um, was mm -hmm. uh, the view of one of the referees recently in, in the examiner. Um, and I, I'm just interested in, in how Galway would have prepared for those games where you know what's coming, you know that the stick work is going to lead to physical altercations and that Limerick are backing <coughs> themselves to win those and that yeah. that's where they're that's where over the course of 74, 75, 76 minutes, they're going to win the game. How do you prepare for that? And, and what do you do to try and stop that happening? Well, firstly, you have to know what you're playing. And I know Limerick, the, I suppose, the, the first word that comes to Limerick to, to people's minds when they, when they talk of Limerick is physical. But also beyond that, let's say, they're absolutely excellent stick players. You know, in every in every line of the pitch, when you look at Sean Finn, Declan Hannon, Keane Lynch, carry through all those lines, they're fantastic stick players. But you've got to get in their face. You know, you can't allow Limerick any time and space to be popping balls out, out to wings, giving Hegarty likes a space for into, giving Kyle Hayes channels to go up. So really it becomes a case of neutralising that effect. And that's very difficult to do because they're, they're, so, they're so fit and strong, but you've got to front up against them heavy. Really, really front up against them heavy. What we tried last year was to create a seventh defender almost. We brought back in the midfielder trying to crowd out the forward line because we knew they're full forward in, in the likes of Aaron Galan and Peter Casey and these guys. They want a space to run to the 13 and 15 corner. So we tried to make it was a war zone in the middle third. When you look at Limerick of 16, 17, they were hitting balls into the forwards from, let's say, 30 yards back. And that was allowing opposition half-back lines to, to cut it out. Where, what they've done now in 17, 18, 19, 20 is they've moved that transition to play. So where they're hitting the ball from now is from their half-back line up, getting it into the 13 and 15 cor corner and creating huge damage. And even if Galan and the likes are getting caught in the corners, they have a fantastic out ball in Morrissey and Hegarty. So what we tried to do was blockade that line up front Stop them getting the past 30 yard line, try get them to deliver the ball under pressure up in the forwards, and then hope that will give our guys a chance to jump for a 50 50 ball. Um, it doesn't quite work out that way. What, what Limerick are excellent do is they're excellent at, at, at readjusting their game plan. So that's why the water breaks is it's another topic entirely. But the water breaks provides Paul Knurk a fantastic opportunity to, to reset his team and re-analyze the situation, what's going on, and then adjust. And I, I don't think anyone's caught on to it at the minute how to, how to actually beat Limerick in the Heat of Championship game. But, as I said earlier, I think Galway best place to do it in the future. So, so what is what is the readjustment you tend to see then? Uh, um, so what you, generally what Limerick can do is they go 15 on 15 and nearly like, nearly like suss you out, you know. And I suppose they'll make a slight personal adjustment. They, they nearly give Hegarty and Morrissey a free role to create a bit of chaos. So what you'll find now is Hegarty and Morrissey, they won't play in the traditional 10 and 12. You'll find them 11, 8, 9, different pockets of space. And it's very, very difficult for a defensive setup to come out after a water break or even half time to try and neutralise that. And I think they're giving them with a free role. That's what they're playing with at the minute. Morrissey and Hegarty play with a free role. You can see they don't have a care in the world at the moment. And that's why they're playing so well, essentially. Um, and it's very hard to see when, when you're on the pitch as, as a group of players, it's very hard to adjust. So when you see what you, let's say, for example, the first quarter and then the second quarter is entirely different. It's very hard for a team to adjust that. And that's why if you look at the second quarter, Limerick usually dominate. And on the fourth quarter, they do the same thing as well. And that was proven in the water final last year. 
I mean, it, it's it's really interesting to hear you talk about this because, like, um, knowing knowing all that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you stop it? And getting their faces is great, and then they come out after the water break, and suddenly everything has changed again. Like, it, it, you kind of need to almost have some artificial intelligence in your own team to go, okay, this is this is the reset that they've done, and we've seen this before. Yeah. That's a, that's a very difficult question to answer. I, I, I would class myself as a bit of an analyst when it comes to, uh, to looking at hurling games and Limerick are a team that just haven't quite figured out yet. You know, I'm looking at Nicky Quaid and his poke out strategy and it looks simplistic in his form, but I still haven't figured out how an opposition team would neutralise it because a, a huge platform that Limerick have is from their poke out. So that's the first thing you have to do with Limerick is you just stop their poke out, you stop their primary ball winners winners and that's essentially Hegarty and Morrissey. I know I keep referencing back to those two, but they're the two key, key players for Limerick and they make them tick. And how do you stop it? I'm not quite sure at the minute, you know. I suppose from Galway's perspective, they have players, I just mentioned a while ago, they have players in the Cop Menions, Conor Wheel and Brian Cannon that can go front up, toe to toe with Limerick. So it's really trying to implement your own game plan as best possible. So like, when you look at the likes of, in the background, Dottie Burke and Gareth McInerney, etc., you've got defenders who have the quality to take care of Limerick if, if enough pressure can be put on the middle third. So that, that middle third has become essentially a war zone at the moment uh, in hurling terms. And that's where a lot of the frees have been committed. You, you, you look at 45 to 45, an awful lot of the issues that you, you've seen highlighted over the past week or two are with rugby style tackles with arms in, slaps, and it's because there's so many bodies in the middle third. So with that middle third, you've got to win that battle, and essentially if you win that, it's like the scrum in rugby. You win the scrum, you win the game. So so managers don't care about you giving away frees if they feel like it's having it's wearing down the opposition over the course of the match. They're almost willing to accept that there'll be five or six frees conceded, but the trade-off is that there will be 10 or 15 tackles that you can't get penalised for because the referee is not going to blow everything and over the course of the game that nullifies the effect. Correct. Like, and you look at okay, inter-county games, it's always a question of the spectacle versus the rules in my book. So again, we look at last weekend and the Goal the goal Limerick game in particular, an awful lot of the, the frees that were given away were very, very technical frees. There were arm puts, there were slaps, there were slight body checks, you know. Managements will be allowed to, you, you will actually promote that. You're promoting to, to increase physicality in the middle third under, with the understanding you're going to give away a freeze. So if you can give away a free in the, from the opposition's, let's say, 30 yard line back, the threat there is not exactly massive. You can allow your, your team, your defensive to set up again and then uh, create a 50 50 opportunity to come in. So, and it's the same thing with the short book outs. You see them, what, you, what teams don't want to do right nowadays is poke the ball on because they know the defenses are back there and they've got numbers back there. So if, if, a, if a puck out goes short, what you can do is invite the opposition onto you. And if you, if needs be, use the sideline as your defender and then foul. And again, it forces the team then to go along where you have numbers at the back. You know, so it's a, it's a tricky one at the, at the minute because um, you, you look at, I was just saying about the spectacle, you know, as a spectator, you, we, we'd have all been disappointed. You know, the hurling fanatics would have been disappointed with what games we saw at the weekend. Um, but again, I have to side on the, on the element of the referees. What player, players have done over the last couple of years is they've pushed the boundaries. So essentially, they've been getting away with the arm puts. They've been getting away with the slaps and slight body checks in the interest of the spectacle. And I think referees at the moment, what helps them is there's no crowds. If that was a Munster, a Munster Championship game or an Ireland semi final, an awful lot of the frees that you've seen over the course of the league would not be given because the crowd would be going crazy. So yeah. That's another interesting topic to debate. No, I think you're, I think you're bang on. Uh, the really intriguing tactical conversation around last weekend was Tip's approach to Cork. Obviously, Cork had got a new goalkeeper <laughs> this season. What was your take on that, first of all, the decision by Tipperary to, to surrender the short book out to Cork? Yeah, it was it was kind of a funny one. Like, I think for, I have to look at Cork's perspective first. So again, if I'm putting myself in Kieran Kingston's shoes, I would look to Cork for the history in the last number of years. And they would have got ridiculed uh, with regard to poking the ball along, no ball winners and not creating goal chances. So here they are now two games in with with six goals scored. Mm -hmm. And so that and that's pr predominantly from, from my perspective, it's on the back of a short goal strategy. So what they've done is they've, they've created a strategy for themselves that suits themselves. What I think should have happened is Tim should have pushed up, went man on man and forced Cork to put the ball down on top of Heffernan, Hardy Maher, Ronan Maher, these guys who have huge height advantages over Cork. But they just sat off too deep. They invited Cork, uh, they invited Cork to attack them and set up Cork's game plan. Uh, which I think when you, when you look at the minute, if they meet in a Munster Championship game again, I think that and anyone, if anyone meets Cork, they've got to press Cork. You've got to go 15 on 15 against Cork and force them into a physical battle. What Cork don't like, again, in my opinion, is they don't like 50-50 challenges. They, they don't like the ball, as they go into a neutral zone where, where it was evenly contested. They want space. They want their guys to get on the ball and do hurl, let hurling do the work. Whereas other teams, like Galway, for example, they want to mix hurling and physicality, whereas I don't think Cork can mix that at the minute. So why don't they push up then? That's a good question. It's a great question. I don't know. I, it's because like, when you consider that Tip 
Again, the score line just didn't do it exact justice. So Tiff turned over Cork a good bit. Now, I know the conditions didn't let us, there was rain and wind, etc. but Tiff had an, an unmerciful amount to wise, and they just didn't do it on the scoreboard. If I'm Liam Sheedy looking at that game, I'm, I'm quite content. You know, we haven't been beaten, essentially, and uh, there's loads to work on from their perspective. But I, I don't know, it could be Liam Sheedy. I, I think he's looking at that, and he's probably looking at the, the middle third of Cork and Timo Mahoney and, and the half-hour Robbie O'Flynn, etc., and saying there's danger there, so they wanted to pack out like how the middle thirds I spoke about uh, again. And like that, that's what most team managers are doing at the minute. They're, they're nearly afraid of the threat of goals coming. Um, because essentially, if you get goals, you're winning games really. So they're, what they're trying to do is block off that, that as I said, from the 65 back. Um, and I think that, that's the main reason why Tip uh, introduced that tactic. Isn't why it, they didn't push up? Interesting. Isn't the other thing, though, that everybody's trying to build a team to stop Limerick? So what, what Tip Rary are doing against Cork in the league is trying to come up with a format and style of play that is actually designed with one one match in mind really like yeah, yeah. It's, I, I, I agree with you. it's a bit like I the dubs in football you have to you have to have a style of play that's going to beat dublin there's no point winning everything else because you're just going to get hammered in in the big game against yeah. the champions like what you're essentially doing is a uh, specifically in the league in the championship you've got one eye on who's, who's the, the standard bearer at the minute and if you go through games trying to win each game with an individual game plan you're essentially delaying the inevitable when you meet Limerick because you won't have a game plan that has been practiced, tried and tested or even or proven. So I agree with you. I agree with you wholeheartedly. If, if I'm looking at Galway, I just have to go back to Galway again. What they seem to do is, is trying to implement a game plan that's going to take down Limerick because who's knocked them out the last couple of years? Obviously, it's been Limerick. Um, and maybe that's what Tip Tipperary are doing because, again, what you don't want Limerick to do or you don't want against Limerick is you don't want to be giving the ball, letting Nicky Quaid, poke it into 10 and 12 and giving it to Keane Lynch so you're trying to block off that area and create as many bodies and limit space and it's essentially create a pandemonium with so many bodies in there. Hence why the sharp lookout is so, is, uh, you see, it's so, it's so relevant now at the moment, especially with Cork. Can, can I just ask, as a goalkeeper, when you see the opposition drop off, are you rubbing your hands together thinking brilliant or are you thinking they want me to do this and maybe I shouldn't do that thing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I suppose when you were asking that question, I instantly think of, of a Leinster final we played in 2018 in Cork Park against Kinney. And I suppose our, our team at the time would have been would have been very physical, very tall, great ball winners for primary possession. And we'd have had Johnny Glynn in the half forward line, who, who, who we know is a, essentially a man mountain. But what Kikini would have done at the time, and it was interesting for me looking out, was they would have put three or four bodies on Johnny Glynn's side. And they would have essentially vacated the far side. So they were nearly tempting me to go down the opposite, the opposite wing, not to have the ball to Johnny Glynn. Because if I did put it to Johnny Glynn, who is our primary ball winner, they had three or four bodies to, to, to neutralise his threat. So what they were doing was trying to put me down the far side. And I think when you look at teams nowadays, especially with someone who is who's who are as physical as, for example, Tipperary, I'm using Cochrane's example now, they're sharp about. You look out, you see Cody Maher, Ronan Maher, Seamus Kennedy, Barry Heffernan. They're all six four plus. What you don't want to do is land the ball down top of those guys. It it, it sings of what, what you used to have against Kikini in years previous with JJ and Tommy. You don't want to what you want to do is come up with a game plan that you can go shorter to go over them. The best way the best direction you want those guys, especially in Tipperary, is going back towards their own goal. And the only way you do that, I think, is if you play multi-phase, that's the IE, start, start the ball short and go and get over them. Putting the ball down top of them, it's not 50-50, it's essentially 70-30 in their favour. It's amazing, isn't it, how the game has completely reacted to that half-back line and, and that spine of your defence becoming yeah. so important in hurling. Absolutely, like, uh, you, you, you hear the phrase an awful lot with goalkeepers with regards to quarterback, and essentially that's what they are. You know, they, they have the most possessions in the games nowadays, so they're, best, they're basically starting the attack. So if you're putting an attack and send them down to the opposition's best players, because predominantly your number six, uh, five, five, six, seven nowadays are three of your best players. You're not really giving your team an advantage. Like, you know? So what you're trying to do is, as a goalkeeper, trying to assess what's in front of you, obviously, from a long and short game. And again, the same thing is, if you had a team that pushes up to you and goes man on man, then that creates space. So as a defender, you can either mark the space or you can mark the man. You can't do both. So, but it's, it's such a, it's, that's why the goalkeeper nowadays is such a pivotal position. Like, that goalkeeper has got to assess that. He's looking at this in real time. He's not getting fed information. He's not getting plays stopped like you see in NFL and getting information put into him and wired up. So he's doing everything in real time. That's why the position now is the difficulty level of, of playing goalkeeper has just increased you know, tenfold over the last couple of years. Last question for you here because um, we're nearly out of time. But what about Cork? Because there's a, there's a sense they're zigging a little bit while everybody else is zagging and that they're trying mm -hmm. to come up with their own identity which they think will work against Limerick, but will also work against the other teams because you know they're not guaranteed that they're going to be in yeah. you know, in the biggest games of the year against Limerick. Yeah, well, it's, it's a case of with Cork, let's say, over the last number of years, you, know, you do what you've always done, you get what you've always got. So what they're trying to do now is, is, is change it up and put a focus on a new type game plan. 
We've seen Cork with the short ball over, it seems like a lifetime ago now, in 0 3 and 0 4 is how they got around the Great Kikini team back then. And I think they're trying to re re implement that, that now at the moment. It suits their style of play. You know, they've got lovely hurlers. You go down to every pitch in Cork, the surface in every pitch is fantastic, and they're all hurlers. They don't really have the, the big physical men who can contest with the big half back lines, contest with the hard midfields. They had no Harry the last day. They had no John Patrick, like Patrick Cronin or an Aidan Walsh. So they're going to have to do something that suits them. And that's why the short ball is introduced. And they are getting a lot of ridicule. You'll see on Twitter and social media over the weekend they were getting ridiculed by the, by the fanatics who, who want a better spectacle. But if I'm putting myself in Kieran Kingston's shoes as a manager, I'm trying to win the game. You know, it's a results-driven business. And that's for the short ball at the moment to suit, to suit your guys and suit your team. Cork has such pace. They have such hurlers that they can move guys around the pitch. I mean, we're talking about big bodies. We're talking about Chipperary, Limerick, Galway, big bodies. The best thing to do is make that ball move and get them, get them big bodies wearing wear out by having chased the ball. So I think Cork, in my opinion, should keep doing what they're doing, try and perfect the game over the course of the next league, and it'll give them a nice run in the championship. Yeah, and, and it will, uh, as we all know, uh, styles make fights, and having somebody else doing something different is a brilliant live experiment for us all to watch unfold over the course of the summer. James, that was brilliant. Thanks a million. No bother, guys. Thanks for having me, OK? That's a brilliant analysis there from James Gale, giving us an insight into what it's like to be in goals on those big days. Um, and particularly <laughs> facing uh, the might of some of those big men that he's been talking about, for example. A reminder, OTBM, live in association with Gillette. Good morning, Star with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. We'll get to John Duggan in one second. We'll bring you another Euros cheat sheet from Group A, and uh, Joe Malloy is going to talk to us about the golf a little bit later on. But I want to tell you about this, because next Thursday, May the 27th, our exclusive UEFA Champions League final preview show in a, a partnership with Pepsi Max, takes place. We're going to be joined by Manchester City and Chelsea legend Sean Wright Phillips for a chat about his fascinating career. Irish superstar Denise O'Sullivan and Man United hero Teddy Sheringham will talk to us about that night in Barcelona. It's all part of our uh, UEFA Champions League final preview show in partnership with Pepsi Max. And the only way that you can watch the full show is to catch it live on the night. So uh, go for it. Register now and get your tickets on otbsports.com forward slash events. Pepsi Max, maximum taste, no sugar. The hashtag is for the love of it. John Duggan, good morning to you. Hi, Jaron Owen, how are we doing? What's going on? Uh, well, I think Liverpool have it now. Top four, you'd have to Ooh, say. Do you oh, think? The, I think so, yeah. Crystal Even though Palace, Roy, Ho Roy Hodgson. Roy Hodgson. Yeah, yeah, I know there's lots of twists and storylines and plots and all that kind of thing. And uh, and Roy will be dropping the mic maybe at full time on Sunday at about, what, six o'clock. But I think um, Liverpool will uh, get the job done. Uh, I think it's in the stars after what Alisson did last week. And it was a, ultimately a comfortable, I think, enough 3-0 uh, no win over Burnley last night. And that Phillips with his first goal for the club, uh, sandwich between uh, Firmino and Oxlade-Chamberlain. All they need to do is better Leicester's result against uh, Spurs on Sunday. Spurs lost 2-1 last night. Harry Kane, was that a farewell, tearful inside? Although I didn't really see the tears flow. Lap of honour. Um, as, as the fans booed uh, the, the players off the pitch in that defeat to Aston Villa. I suppose as well, you got to remember that it's not completely done for Chelsea. They still need to get the job done against Aston Villa on Sunday. That's where last night, uh, Arsenal beating Palace 3-1. Newcastle winning against Sheffield United 1-0. Everton beating Wolves by a goal to nil. And West Brom manager Sam Allardyce leaving his position and slamming Mikel Antonio after that 3-1 uh, defeat to West Ham. And the Hammers only need a point uh, to get into the Europa League. And David Moyes, to be fair, has uh, been the resurrection man in football and he, he deserves a lot of credit because he was a bit of an object of ridicule at some stage. So it's, it's great to see somebody bounce back in that, in that manner, in that fashion. When, when it is Big Sam versus David Moyes, somebody's ridicule is going to end eventually. So that, that, that's the beauty <laughs> of modern football. Absolutely, it is. Um, but there'll be somebody else next week or next season that'll be that uh, in that chair. Mm, for sure. What, what did you make of uh, Big Sam's comments? Just grumpy, grumpy because he's lost that he's lost that beautiful record of being uh, a manager who's never relegated. So of course you're going to be grumpy in that situation. I think that was just to say to, to say to use the word disgusting. I think was a little bit over the top. I mean, come on. Oh, we all tap tick them. Uh, whoever made the big Sam montage that goes out on off the ball on news talk of an evening sometimes is a genius. Uh, and if you haven't caught it, you need to listen to it because um, that'll tell you all you need to know about um, where Big Sam's ego is. And look. Maybe it's the maybe that's what you need. That maybe that's what separates Big Sam from us, us normal people who are not big or small or nothing. Have, we have no monikers. <laughs> maybe that's the difference. You just need an absolutely giant ego. John, the golf. Um, yeah. You've, you've written about um, Paul Carrington today uh, on OTBSports.com, saying that his 
PJ win was the most impressive of all. What what is it about that? Was it just that he was actually in full form and it was the most controlled of his victories? What was it that sticks out for you? Um, there's a strange YouTube video from a person called Hino Designs, which has dance music to uh, the Harrington Garcia duel for the ages, as they called it in this 2008 um, uh, Oakland Hills PJ Championship. And I was reading the transcripts last night of Harrington's week, the, the way he spoke during the week, because he shot 71-74 the first two rounds. And he said he couldn't wait to get off the golf course. And he said that he just doesn't have it. And he just won the Open three weeks before. And he's, he's not, not with it at all. And then he goes and he shoots 66 the final two rounds and wins the PGA by a couple of shots. And just the way he played on that Sunday, he has that wild-eyed look of seriousness and concentration and the purposeful walk. And a major winner from Europe uh, at the PGA was a real rarity. Uh, Tommy Armour was the last winner before Harrington in 1930. So 78 years. And if you look at the US Open as well, only Tony Jacklin had won a US Open in that, in that period. So he had 153 major championships across the PGA and US Open that a European had never won. And for Harrington to the clutch putting, the, 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 the fist pumping, the whole thing was just absolutely fantastic. And I really do believe... Golf in Ireland's had a lot of milestones over the last uh, two decades. We've had a beautiful golden era with Mount Juliet World Golf Championship with the Ryder Cup here. But I wouldn't have maybe felt that Rory and Shane and Gray McDowell and, and, and Darren Clark and Paul McGinley captain the Ryder Cup team would have happened so beautifully if Harrington had not won uh, three majors in 13 months and put us on the map. Maybe we took it for granted a little bit at the time and then McElroy comes along afterwards and we think it's always going to be like this and then actually you realise it isn't. This this is no completely remarkable. Yeah, because Fred Daly was the last major winner before Harrington, 47 to 2007. So I don't know who the next people are going to be. I don't really see that great a roster of, of, of golfer coming through this country and I think we did take them a little bit for granted. Like, I don't think, you know... I, in, in just in terms of I felt I, I almost feel that we, we've been so so what's the word uh, spoiled by by what we've seen the, the last two decades this might not happen again for a while and Harrington was the, was the man who really went out and led in that because I've always felt Harrington has not been necessarily been the most talented golfer in the in, in that's come out of this country but he's had the best mind and he's had the best work ethic and he has willed himself to win major championships three more than Colin Montgomery and three more than Lee Westwood. That wild-eyed look that you mentioned there, um, you obviously can't, he can't have that as the Ryder Cup captain because it's, he's, he's no. not playing and he can't influence it. And I wonder, was that just... Is that just a, a, a once... That golden sweet period that he was able to generate that? Or, for example, if, uh, if next year when the crowds are back at the Irish Open, wherever it is, if he's going well, can he get that wild-eyed thing back at the age that he's at now? It's harder because I think what would happen is he won't be in the position to do that. So Le Hinch, he was what he led after the first round, wasn't able to sustain it for four days. He's 50 this year. We see with Phil Mickelson there recently, it's harder to do it. Golfers do uh, find it harder to put it together for four rounds. But Harrington would say in his press conferences when he felt he was playing well, um, he wouldn't often perform and he felt when he wasn't playing well, he would perform. So there's almost a reverse psychology with him that he actually thrived under the adrenaline and the pressure and the test that he got actually more and more out of himself, the harder the conditions were, even in terms of his own game and then the opposition and the competition. So it, it was he really was able to dig deep in a way that a lot of other golfers were not able to. And Jack Nicholas always said that majors are the easiest to win because so many players couldn't handle the pressure. But Harrington thrived on the pressure in the opposite way. And that's what we saw with that, um, that look, as it were, that stare that you'd see it occasionally with Harrington in the heel of the hunt in the back nine of a major. And that's why all those putts started going in. Like Some of those putts were just sensational in the final round of that uh, US PGA. And he broke Garcia, broke him twice in, in 13 months. It was, it was good drama. John, good stuff. Thanks a million. All right, lads. Enjoy the PGA. That uh, trip down memory lane is available for you on otbsports.com and on the OTB Sports app. There'll be more from John Duggan, of course, across the day. Uh, there and on uh, the breakfast show on News Talk as well. 8.44 this morning here on OTBAM, the uh, sports breakfast show from Off the Ball. We're live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Liverpool against Palace is live on Sunday's OTB. Stephen Doyle and Brian Kerr on duty for that one. It is really 
the last most important game of the season. Are you convinced, Owen, that this is straightforward or that the ghosts of Christian Benteke, the ghosts of the season of the slip where everybody thought, oh, wasn't, it wasn't Gerard's slip at all. It was the Palace game that cost him the league that year. Maybe, maybe Palace, maybe Roy Hodgson. What a twist in the tale that would be. It's uh, very much not the ghost of Christian Benteke, but the very real, tangible Christian Benteke, who is all of a sudden in really good form, which I would be concerned about this weekend. Liverpool are probably going to win, and they will qualify for the Champions League. I would be surprised if they, if they didn't at this point. But it's ner like it's nervy. Nobody's saying that it's 100% it's, it's going to happen. My prediction is that, that it will happen for them. But Palace just comes back with so much PTSD for Liverpool fans. Whether or not that is actually the case for... For Jurgen Klopp, I'm not so sure. The last time he played them, he beat them 7-0. So. <laughs> well, you know, stranger things have happened in uh, one season turnaround. So uh, Liverpool are 7-1 to one on at the moment to win that game. Crystal Palace 16-1 to one and the draw 13-2. to two. So all the money says, all the markets say that it's Liverpool's. They're nailed on. They're a certainty. They're as, as certain as you can be. But that's why we play the games, right? It is final, uh, the final Euros cheat sheet of the day. It, uh, who's left? Switzerland. Yeah, Switzerland, let's get our 90-second timer going on the Swiss team who are uh, back at another tournament where they will inevitably crash out at the group stage or in the round of 16. Nothing memorable has ever happened to Switzerland at a major tournament with the exception of the last World Cup where Granit Xhaka and Jordan Shaqiri almost started another Balkan war. They eventually lost to Sweden in the round of 16. In Russia and in France in 2016, they lost to Poland also in the round of 16. So they finished top of Ireland's group in qualification in a campaign that feels like it happened in the 1990s. Despite surrendering a three-goal lead to Denmark and a one-goal lead to David McGoldrick, they still top that group despite having scored fewer goals than Denmark and conceding more goals than Ireland. Now, picking a star player from this team is a difficult task. Granit Xhaka has only been intermittently awful for Arsenal this season, so maybe he's going to be a big player. Jordan Shaqiri, meanwhile, is obviously the other big Premier League star in the team, but quite how he will uh, recover from an arduous season where he played a full 90 minutes on two occasions. Well, that certainly remains to be seen. We'll finish by looking at the kit. We've showed it to you there. This is the home kit. My expert opinion on this one is that it is red and it is nice. Uh, let us have a look at the away kit. As you can see, it's got pink, purple, maroon and green stripes in the middle, symbolising the country's four languages, which are German, French, Italian and Reto Romanic. And thus concludes today's fashion show. And would you look at that? I've managed to do Switzerland in less than 90 seconds. What a surprise. So much to talk about when it comes to Switzerland. OK. Is there... I mean, they keep getting out of their group uh, tournaments, though. Every second tournament. I think, you've got to, I think you've got to go back to the World Cup that they hosted in the 1950s to find a tournament that they actually got to the quarterfinals in. So if they don't get knocked out in the round of 16, they get knocked out in the group stage. That tends to be how it goes. Like, they've been, they've been good uh, over the last little while, like, results-wise. Like, you can look at Swiss results and always say that they, they, they've been good. Like, they've got draws against Germany and Spain in the Nations League. They're in Group A in, in that, so they're playing quite a, a high standard of opposition. Mm -hmm. They survived, they didn't get relegated, they also had Ukraine in their group. They beat them 3-0 on the last day, but they only beat them 3-0 because the match did not happen. Uh, Ukraine got a massive COVID outbreak and the game was forfeited and Switzerland got the 3-0 win and they managed to survive in, in League A. Uh, in their World Cup qualifying so far, they've beaten Bulgaria and Lithuania. They've also played Finland and they've beaten them. And they've got a couple of friendlies before the Euros where they play Liechtenstein and the USA. So they'll have their tails up going into the tournament. It's uh, a nice thing I can say about Switzerland. Prediction? Prediction for Switzerland. Uh, I don't think they're going to progress from the group. I think that they're looking at Turkey and they're looking at Wales as teams that they can beat. But again, I'm picking Turkey to be the team that go through with Italy. And I don't think the third place team are going through. So either Wales or Switzerland are going to come third. But I've got a feeling that they're both going to be disappointed. OK, so you predicted today that both Wales and Switzerland will finish third. I like, I like the... OK, let's call it, okay, Wales to finish third, Switzerland to finish fourth. OK, OK. Calling it. Uh, can we get your thoughts on the uh, highly controversial in the shirt community away shirt of Italy? If we can get that image back up. So this is highly controversial white shirt with um, the word Italian in the middle of the chest. It's Puma. They've got the... Italian flag, it must be the Italian Football Federation and four gold stars over for the four World Cups. And what do you think of this, Owen? Well, to quote from people who know what they're talking about, Puma have launched a new Italy away kit that will be used this summer at Euro 2020 and beyond. Inspired by the Only See Great platform, the German brand reaches beyond the status quo to innovate and craft a new creative direction for the Italy away kit, blurring the lines 
between football and fashion. Indeed, those blurred lines between football and fashion are the reason why I love sport so much. So there you go, there's the, the Italy kit. We didn't do the turkey kit either yesterday, which was an absolute sin, because look at this. The, the tur turkey kit is gorgeous. Is it? Well, actually, no. Nah. Is this, uh, like, is, is, this supposed to, is this the sort of thing we're supposed to say is nice? You see, this is where I get confused when it comes to football shirts. That football shirt looks distinctly different. So do we automatically give that points? Or is it the fact that it actually looks kind of a bit tacky, two different shades of red? Does that count against it? Like, can, can somebody just give me tips on how to judge a football kit? Because I don't know if that's nice or not. I know that it looks different. But I can, e I can easily see just, people who know better than me saying, that's gorgeous, and other people saying, what are you talking about? That's awful. I don't know. Just... Just think of it like a music track, Owen. How does it make you feel? Can, can we get, you can we get that the, up again? Can we get the turkey one? Yeah, give us the turkey one there. It, like, uh, How does it make you feel, Owen? Feel this kit now. Feel it. Close your eyes and feel that kit. It feels exotic. It, feels, it looks a bit like vulcanised rubber across the, um, the man boobs, doesn't it? Yeah. Vulcanized rubber on the man boob is, is a, bit, a prerequisite it's, it's for a, a modern It's a bit Bergine, isn't it? Um, actually, yeah, it's, it's good. That will be the sort of thing that will get you into Bergine in 2042. Like, that'll be a, a, a really crap retro kit. Down, I don't down think you're getting into Bergine in 2042, Owen. Oh, no, I'm talking, to break about, to you now. I'm talking about one. I, I can't get in there now. I've never, like, I mean, I don't stand a hope now, uh, despite how, how well-dressed I am and how uh, cool and flash I am. Um, like so, down the line, if you are interested in going to a Berlin nightclub, that is a jersey for you. Like I, I often wonder if people who wore retro jerseys when they weren't retro and they actually came out actually knew how nice they are, because obviously every retro jersey now is class by by all accounts. Okay, we've gone down a, a wormhole here. <laughs> it's, we didn't get to Switzerland's key players, but like, I mean, who cares? Okay. It's, uh, well, our, it's our obviously. The mood out I mean, there. you mentioned them. Do, do, you, you, you ask us, to, you tell us about their key players, but you've already told us about their key players. Are there other key players? I, w I would say that there, there are other key players, uh, a couple of players. I, I would say, like, we've, we've played in uh, Switzerland. We know what to expect from Switzerland. The, the, the two Premier League stars are, are the ones that, that will stand out. But I would say Breelan Bolo, who's obviously played against Ireland a, a couple of times. He's been playing with Munchen Gladbach, has got Champions League experience. Watch out for him. And then also, uh, watch out for Harris Seferovic, who is in the habit of scoring a lot of goals. He scored 20 for Benfica this season. But um, his international record isn't great. He has scored two in his last three games at international level. So okay. uh, himself, Shakiri and Bolo up front. Is that semi-exciting? Does, does that push you to actually root for Switzerland a little bit? No. I think not. I think this is the team that people probably want to see knock it out of Group A. And I'm sorry to, to all our lovely Swiss viewers who are no doubt with us this morning. OK, OTBAM live in association with Jalek. Good morning, start with Jalek. I mean, the conference attack for the head. Our Euros cheat sheet will continue on a daily basis between now and the start of the Euros, which isn't that far away. Uh, let's move on. It's time for us to turn our attention properly to the golf. Uh, Joe Malloy is with us this morning. Joe, good morning to you. How are you? When is Unchain's review of all the Premier League jerseys starting is the key question. I mean, that's a good... That, that, mm. I mean, it's going to be a long summer. <laughs> <laughs> What, like who who even has a nice like Arsenal, Arsenal actually that's the thing Ar like I mean uh, the I saw someone tweet once that did you know that retro fashion brand Arsenal also play football hey. which I thought was a, a, a nice old burn like, they are the kings of it Joe uh, which is yeah. uh, which is I great agree. yeah I would agree always for a long time I've been kings yeah it's um yeah they're they're beautiful so we should do that we should do the Premier League jerseys but the problem is outside of that I could, like I look at the Liverpool jersey last night it looks like a tablecloth but maybe people like that sort of stuff. Maybe they do. I don't know. Uh, can we talk about golf? And I, I, I look obviously the the PJ. Uh, it's a big tournament. We'll talk about that, and we'll talk about Rory and all that kind of stuff. From an Irish perspective, though, I just wanted to kick things off um, in a slightly unusual spot. The relationship between Pora Carrington and Shane Lowry is endlessly fascinating to me, and the amount of time that they spend together is also fascinating because uh, you know, in their public utterances and. And so many other ways, they, they seem to be quite different characters. And clearly there's something similar in them that draws each other to each other. But there's enough difference for us to think this is definitely sports version of the odd couple. And yeah. I'm extremely interested in the pressure that Harrington must feel to be thinking about picking Larry for the Ryder Cup. And what would happen on a national level if Harrington didn't pick Larry, given they seem to be best mates? I think yeah. it would be up there with Gatland dropping Draco for the last game of the Lions. Yeah. I mean, it's so competitive. There are a lot of names 
and not many picks. And if Larry's relying on a pick, I think it gets tricky. Now, I don't know. I, we were talking about this. It just came up a couple of weeks ago just on Golf Weekly. And Peter Laurie, who knows both pretty well and certainly knows Harrington well, was of the opinion that Harrington would have no qualms about not picking Larry. <laughs> No way! I mean, I want, I want, I want a documentary now that films them and and reveals to the world. Like, I actually don't want a documentary. I want a, a, a weekly, daily series. I want the Kardashian style, <laughs> Im, embedded TV crews with the two of them, just showing to the world how well they get on together. Like they're they're living together at various stages, in different parts of the country, yeah. in America. Yeah. You know, and and I'm sh I'm sure they're on the same flights, and I'm sure it's like constant back and forth and then that bit where it's like listen I haven't uh, I've have, I have no room for you this week it's like mm -hmm. what I know it makes 2022 interesting the living arrangements um, yeah I don't know it's going to be so fascinating I really hope it doesn't come to that I'm sure Harrington really hopes it doesn't come to that um, yeah but like I mean then he'll be open to accusations of favoritism the golfing world over you know we might be happy here that's, that's tricky territory especially when you're going in as not rank outsiders, but this US team is seriously good. And, you know, Ryder Cup captains get torn apart for all their mistakes when things don't go well. So he's got to do what he sees fit. But, uh, oh, I, I, I don't envy him that decision if it comes down to it. I, look, the labyrinthine process of qualifying for the Ryder Cup stretched over the long period of time that it has been because of COVID. Is, is Larry close or what does, he, what does he need to do? Does he need to win a couple of tournaments between now and whenever this stops? Or how much? what's the time frame for him? I'd be lying if I told you that was... I mean, I love golf, Chair, but <laughs> life is too short sometimes. I'll worry about the Ryder Cup selections about a month before. I don't know. I know winning a couple of tournaments takes care of everything. Um, so I, I, I genuinely couldn't tell you how close he is. But I know the last time we looked at it a few weeks back, uh, the competition is frightening. So it's not easy. And it probably will take winning a tournament or two along the way. Right. He has to pick yeah. him. Irrespective, he has to. I don't care who who else is not available, or who hasn't qualified. Like, it's a major winner. That that pick kind of grandfathers you in, doesn't it? I don't know if it does. Um, I will do. Like, let me go away and have a look at this, and I'll come back in a month or something. Because genuinely, the list of names outside the twelve is quite extensive now, and there's some good names there, and people with serious Ryder Cup pedigree there who are still playing good golf. So. It's, it's genuinely very, very competitive. And a couple of rookies on the scene who are forcing their way in, like a Victor Hovland, who's, you know, one of the favourites for even this week because his form is so good. All these guys are on the scene now and they're young and you've got the old guard still hanging around. A lot of them, like someone like Lee Westwood, didn't think a year ago Lee Westwood would be in the mix for Ryder Cup. He's probably played himself onto the team or pretty close to it last time I looked. So, um, yeah, like he has to pick him, but he only has three picks. Westwood, so. I'm actually on the Ryder Cup um, okay. on the European standing. So oh, yeah, give it to us. Fleetwood, yeah. Ram, Hatton, McElroy, Hovland, Westwood, Fitzpatrick, Perez and Casey are the top nine as it stands mm. with only three captain's picks. Wiesberger, McIntyre, Willett and Garcia are on the bubble. See, it, Garcia will be attempting pick if he's showing any form. Going to the US, experience. Willett, yeah. I, guess I think Garcia gets in first, and then you're like, ah, Shay, come on, I was only messing, <laughs> I was had you on my team the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> does your list go on? Does it, does it That's have it. Names? No, it doesn't. Oh, right, it's right. like, it's not... Uh... I'd have to do an extensive one for you. I, look, the last time we talked about it, Peter Laurie was adamant that Harrington, of all people, would not be, not be swayed by that stuff. Now, how could you not be? How, like, honestly, human nature, how could you not be? But... Uh, I don't know. Last time we looked, it was, God, a lot of big names there to pick from. It was one of the reasons Harrington only wanted three picks. Like with COVID and everything, he could have probably pushed for like six picks at a certain point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where he said, I want as few picks as possible. His logic was that I want maybe five people to pick from, you know, in contention, give or take. If I only have three picks, I want about five, six who have legitimate claims. And his, you know, he was, his thinking was, for every person that you leave off who has a legitimate claim, there's probably two, three of his mates on the team who think, oh, you should have picked him. So he didn't want that atmosphere hanging around. So he's gone for a limited number of picks here. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, like, 
I hadn't given it too much thought because it was always always just felt so far away. But I guess we're kind of there now. This yeah. is the summer where Larry has to kind of do it. And like he's been aching to be in a Ryder Cup team for so long. He's 34th, according to the rankings, it says at the moment. So plenty of time, plenty of opportunity. And tournaments like this where he's beginning to show a bit of form, where there's two days of, of a week where he'll, he'll play really well, two days of a week where he won't. And then you're just thinking, oh, we just need one big week where you stick it all together, start to finish, let's go. He's that type of player. He's that type of player. I think it's we, we've come to realise that with Larry, that he'll have periods where he's not there. And then when he is there, he's not afraid to go and win and to win big. And bit of wind this week. I know it's not Lynx per se, but it's Lynx style is what they're calling it. I mean, hell, he won his major on one of the best Lynx in the world. We talked to him recently in Golf Weekly, said he's been uh, striping the ball, hitting the ball great, but the putter was not behaving itself. But that's sort of come around a little bit in the last while, so he's feeling a bit more optimistic. If you believe in the rhythms of a season, he often plays well from summertime on, would often play well at Wentworth in May and kick on for the summer. So, you know, there's all those ingredients kind of knocking around with Shane Larry. He's about 66 to 1. So uh, the bookies don't quite agree. But, um, you know, you wouldn't be shocked. He was there, you know, he was hanging around the Masters and, and played pretty well there. So I would, uh, you'd quietly say, I'd say he's looking around this week and looking at those ingredients thinking this, you know, even though people aren't talking about me now, in retrospect, it'll be very explainable if I go on and win. Uh, let's talk about Rory, because that's obviously the other big story at the moment where all of the newspapers have suddenly decided that, oh, he's won a tournament, he's back, baby, that's it. No need to worry about anything that's happened before. And, like, it would be it would be an incredible story if he was to, to piece it all together here where he's got a great record. Um, but it, it's just a very easy narrative to go, played well, finally, played the weekend, finally, and and won and so therefore he's back he's not quite back is he it feels a bit presumptuous you just feel there's scar tissue built up or you know the 18th even he hooked that three wood in, almost into the water and you know he's now suddenly playing with a fade off the tee he's breaking the habit of a lifetime like the definition of rory for the last 10 years was booming draw with the driver i mean that surely takes some time to settle in and this course off the tee Pete Dye is the architect. One of the traditional Pete Dye challenges is that when you're standing on the tee box, the landing area you're looking at looks tiny. And then you get up there and it turns out there's loads of room. You know, he messes with your head. A lot of the players find him very quirky and difficult. So, you know, all of the, even just something like that for Rory, this is brand new, uh, playing with a fade off the tee. And you watch back 2012. It was interesting. So I was at the Olympics then and I didn't get to watch much of that tournament, but watched it back and read a bit about it. Like, it wasn't a um, ball-striking exhibition that won in that tournament. Like, we're inclined to think that's the case with McElroy. That was how he won a congressional the year before in 2011. But this was, he missed plenty of fairways. He, he, he scrambled unbelievably. Like, he put it so well. He chipped so well. He said as much this week. That's why I won the tournament. Like, there's no guarantees with him and the putter. I know he holds 51 from 51 inside six feet at Quail Hollow. So that's a really good sign. But, you know, he was such a different player eight years ago. Yeah, look, I, I think it's a bit premature. I guess the, the thing you could argue in his favour is that maybe J Jordan Speed aside, none of the other top dogs are in great form. Like, it's amazing how golf ebbs and flows. Like, you, you're never under control of your golf game for very long. All the people around him aren't exactly red hot either. So I think that's probably fed into it. And 2012 has fed into it. And when he last had his big drought in 2014, he won two majors in a WGC in no time. So all of these kind of things are there. I would say he's so he's in such better form than he was before the Masters. Even just watching his press conference, like, uh, like you can just tell he's so happy with his life and things are in great shape and he's he's in a really nice place. And it was, you know, he was it was funny even that um, in his press conference he was asked about the win in 2012 and how important it was to get that second major or where, you know what it, what it meant to him. And uh, his press conference had gone over as it often does with McIlroy because he's quite interesting. And Justin Thomas was at the back waiting to uh, have his press conference. And Justin Thomas has been stuck in one major for a while. And like Rory kind of glint in his eye starts talking about, yeah, look, I mean, there's a lot of people at one major, but it's really important to get to number two. You know, that's the big one and kind of bursts laughing and he can see uh, Justin Thomas in the back. You know, all of this kind of stuff. He's just in a nice place, I think. Uh, he'll be there or thereabouts. But um, oh, yeah, the, the kind of coronation pre-tournament makes me jittery.
Yeah, I, I think I'm exactly the same in terms of that kind of sense that we're just shooing him in for victory and mm. it's, you know. Uh, but I, the other thing that struck me, and I don't know if we spoke about this or not, but the return of fans and him pointing out that that was important to him, I bought it. I 100% I yeah. bought that he was somebody who was feeding off that energy and in a way, maybe that's a psychological trick that Bob Rotella is teaching him, oh, that period is gone now because your bad form is actually connected with the no fans and now the fans are back, so you're back. And like, if, that's, if it is just a trick, fair enough. Yeah. But he, he said it, I believed it, and it makes sense when you watch him. Yeah. See, I was sceptical of it. I was like, come on, you know. I think Pete Cowan has more to do it and Bob Rattel has more to do with it. But I think your point is also very true. If he believes it, then it's true. Do you know, it doesn't actually matter if it's nonsense or not. If it's a trick and the trick works, then the trick is real. Exactly. And yeah. I, mean, I, I, I don't know, because I, I do believe that Liverpool have suffered more than other teams. I do believe that, like, Man United's yeah. home form, because the fans aren't there and because the funereal atmosphere of Old Trafford is gone, now their home form has actually not been very good. But uh, yeah. and. Sorry to interrupt. To, to be fair to him, like that's a bit dismissive of me. He is like this alpha male who loves attention. You know, to be fair, he always has been. He, 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 he you know, he, his press conferences are interesting because he quite likes attention as well. I mean, it won't have not occurred to him that, geez, when I say these interesting things, it blows up. And he keeps saying these interesting things. Other people run away from that kind of scrutiny and everything else. So he does, he does have a swagger. He, he likes being watched. I guess he's played golf his whole life being watched. It, I, it has to give him some adrenaline as opposed to any nerves at this stage. I mean, he's been on TV as a three-year-old shipping balls. So, look, to be fair, there probably something. There probably is something in it. However, I would definitely place it well after the work that Pete Cowan is doing with him or the work that he's doing with Brad Faxon in a short game. But, yeah, maybe, it, it, you know, it, it, it might rattle some others in a way it doesn't rattle him because he's so used to it, I guess, you know? Jodor is like wild a wild reaction to when Rory was talking about changing his game as a reaction to Bryson DeChambeau and the, yeah. the, the big, big hitters. This week is kind of an interesting time then for that theory to be tested about how much he has fought back against that reaction. Like This is the, the longest course in major history. Like This could be the moment when that transition in the sport is seen at its most naked. Like, I mean, we've all got a little bit of joy out of seeing Bryson DeChambeau maybe struggle uh, at majors over the last little while, but this could be the sort of thing where, where big hitting is, is on vogue once again. Yeah, yeah, I'm really interested to see how Bryson goes. I mean, I think big misses here can end you, end you end up in some funny spots, you know? Like, part of the reason it's so long is to counter the wind. Like, it's, 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 it's unusual us courses how often do we come on here and it's really boring because like we talk about the rough the rough is so long the rough's going to kill them and then the rough doesn't actually bother them at all whereas the defense of this course is the wind and the weather so i think one of the reasons it reads so long on paper is that if you're downwind they need to stretch the tees uh, right back is kind of the thinking now to be fair at the same time if they do want to make it outrageously long john ram was playing this week in his practice round and he was giving out he was saying from the 14th on the shortest iron i hit into a green was a five iron and he said i was playing with zach johnson he pulled a head cover on every single <laughs> hole except the par 5 16 coming into the green for the sake of our sanity i believe they have to use the forward tees i suspect they will i don't think they want to turn it into a bombers fest you know but um yeah like it, <laughs> the 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 last like some of the holes are brutal like the 17 220 yards over water you know, it's kind of scary. The, the lower club you can hit in there, the better for sure. Um, but I don't remember in 2012, it was like a bomber's thing in particular. It doesn't seem to be that kind of a challenge. Length never hurts for sure. But uh, yeah, Bryson, who knows? Who knows? He hasn't really done it at a major since the since the US Open win. And he was wild at Augusta. I'm kind of got, I'm, 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 I'm cooling on Bryson mm. until he does it again at a major because he's just been a little too wild now at two masters and the major pressure and everything. And, and like I said, on this course, like there's some funky spots to get into. And, you know, on the tee, when it looks narrow and he's if he's just a bit off, I'd say things could get very hairy for him psychologically. So I don't know. Like I said, I, I'm looking at like to go to do a short one. McElroy in good form, like on my list, John Ram is second favorite. John Ram, since he changed equipment, I mentioned this to you guys. This was not a good idea on John Ram's part. Uh, his short game has gone to pieces. He's gone from like the 22nd best putter to the 100th outside the top 100 because apparently the ball is all important and that's cost him. Bryson is next favourite. Like for the reasons discussed, I'm not so hot on Bryson. 
Then you have Dustin Johnson, the world number one, is one of the a bunch on 16 to 1. Dustin Johnson's putting has gone off a cliff. He hasn't, you know, he missed the cut at the Masters. So, in so much as you can write off a world number one, you'd be tempted to write him off. Justin Thomas is also on 16s. His putter's very cold. I do really like him. I do give him a big chance. The other player who's in form, the only top dog who's in form alongside McElroy is Speed, and he is in form, and I think he will be there, thereabouts. But you know, it's it's kind of interesting. Sometimes we talk ahead of the majors, and I say, "Geez, how do you pick? They're all in red hot form." Yeah, it's almost like there's there's question marks over them all in some ways now. Is Brooks Kepka's knee okay? Is he no no? He's been, it's mad with him. Like he he's had uh, he's busted his right knee and that and his, his hip, and he was getting injections and all last year. It was a, a write off of a season, and then uh, I think it was earlier this year, just towards the end of last year, he's he's dicking around doing something and he, and he um, dislocates his knee and his Oof. other knee and his other leg. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know what he's doing with his time and he's like had herniated discs in his neck. He said himself this week that he's had two years straight now of pain. It'll be another six months before he's fit. But he said, I can play. So work that out. Right. I, you know, it's it, two years ago, I would have said this guy's going to win X number of majors. And it's amazing how he's managed to kind of I guess it's bad luck if you get injured, but he's kind of made a mess of it too in some ways. Joe, enjoy it. When is the next Golf Weekly out? We're going to do a watch along on Sunday for the subscribers. We did it last um, time for the Masters, kind of half six o'clock territory. We, um, all the listeners get a little link and they come and join us. We had Conor Moore on last time and a couple of special guests. So we've got some really good guests lined up for this one. So they come and we uh, chew the fat as the leaders are starting to tea out and then there's a review pod on Monday morning. Well, enjoy it. Good stuff. Thanks a million for joining okay, us. Cheers. Fellas. See ya. That's uh, Joe Malloy there giving us his thoughts. You can get that Golf Weekly goodness on patreon.com forward slash golf weekly or otbsports.com forward slash golf weekly either. The latest episode of the football pod with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran is available to listen to right now. It is excellent stuff. Again, they, they tell the truth. This show will not tell you the truth about what's going on with Kerry football. It is just, it's impossible for us to chisel it away, to, to <laughs> excavate it properly. But that show will tell you the truth. Unvarnished. Paddy Andrews and Andy Moore in, in conversation with uh, Tommy. It's on the OTV Sports app. Go to the podcast section, you'll find it there. Or you can get it wherever you get your podcasts. And make sure you subscribe. If you're an Apple user, then uh, a review and a comment will be great for us. Here's a taster of what you'll get in episode two. Paddy Andrews on the one penalty that he ever took for the dubs. Costello had an amazing game. I mean... I mean He's been given an opportunity. Dean Rock is out. Paul Mannion's obviously stepped away. People are waiting on Costello to come through and he scores 113 for, you know, so really, really efficient. I'm not going to slay him for missing two penalties in the one match. I'll tell you a funny story. I took one penalty for Dublin in my entire career. I think Andy was, surely enough, of course, it was against Mayo <laughs> in 2017 in the National League. So it was around March time in Crow Park and it was my, uh, it was my first game back. I'd been injured. Uh, so I came on for the last 15 minutes and literally I was on the pitch a minute and Dean Rock got filled into Hill 16 and he got a bad bang and he was injured. So I kind of said, Jesus, I might actually take this here. Well, first touch of this, I'm going, first touch of the season and I'm going to be able to score a goal at the Hill 16. I was like, lovely, what a start to the year. So Dean all goes off and I pick up the ball and I'm doing the whole Cristiano Ronaldo stance, really, really confident. And then it just hits me as I'm standing there taking the penalty. David Clarkson's goal was about nine foot tall, so he's taken up pretty much the entire goal. Uh, and I realised I haven't taken a penalty since probably the mid-90s, playing Fela. So I'm a little bit nervous. The, the, the air of confidence is fading away very, very quickly. So sure enough, I step up to take this penalty, first touch of the season, and I mean, it barely reaches the goal, dribbles to the corner, and David Clark saves it. But the way he saves it, it kind of spins back out to me, right in the middle. I was like, Jesus, right, perfect. I've got another chance here. But the ball was kind of spinning, so I said, don't rush in and try and slash at it because you could slice it wide again. He'd look like even more of a Muppet. So I take my time with this. Clark is on the ground at the corner. I said, nothing can go wrong here. Just get a good strike. Head down, strike the rebound. And as I look up, somehow, I've never seen a man move as fast in my life. David Clark has gone from one corner of the goal, full stretch to the other side of the goal, saves the rebound. And now I'm really up shit's creek. I'm like, God, the ball comes to me for a third rebound. I just lunge at it. But the Mayo lads are in there as well. So I don't know even who makes contact. Hits off um, David Clark again. Three chances to score from the penalty spot. Missed them all. 
and Mayo cleared the ball. And we won the game in the end, but that was my only penalty I ever took with Dublin, a complete and utter. <laughs> but the next night at training, the, thank God Dublin won, because the Tuesday night, this is what I'm talking about, Davy Burns probably facing. We're doing a quick review of the game in the dressing room and uh, kind of going off with it. I might get away with this. Jim might say anything because we won the game. And just as he's finishing, he turns around, he's like, and you, Paddy Andrews, when is the last time you took a fucking penalty? And the lads are, I'm like, oh no, Jesus, I'm under pressure here. I was kind of froze. And the lads are all, the lads are sniggering. I can hear a few lads laughing in the background because they know, and I'm thinking of something to say, and Costello, quick as a light, puts his hand up. We'd been on holidays in Jamaica six weeks before, just on the team holiday from last year's All-Ireland. And Costello pipes in and goes, ah, Jim, I seen him take a penalty on the beach in the five side in Jamaica, and he scored it. And it was a great strike as well. <laughs> and the whole place erupts laughing. <laughs> And to be fair, even Jim Gavin, he didn't laugh, he didn't say anything, he just had a little smile on his face and he walked out and I'd never breathed a sigh of relief as much. <laughs> so Cormac Costello got me out of jail with that. So I can't come on here and say, how did you miss two penalties in the game? Because they're harder than they look, lads, and I'm telling you. <laughs> and I never, I never took a penalty again, even for the club after that. <laughs> Brilliant. Again. And he never did. Tommy, good morning to you. Hi guys, good morning. How good, are we? Good stuff. You managed not to screw up the great story being told there. Well done. I know, I know, Jer. I'm learning. I'm getting there. It's a, it's a real trick of the trade, isn't it? Um, but yeah, the lads, the lads were brilliant again. Uh, I don't know if you got to hear the full thing. Um, I'm actually regretting now that we didn't do an hour and a half again. I kept them to about an hour and five minutes, but we did about, we were chatting for about twenty minutes off air afterwards, and uh, they've got loads of good stuff on our. Okay, man. okay, okay. I, I, I know we next. were giving out to you. It has to be forty minutes because, like, that, all, all the stats show forty minutes is the sweet spot for. That uh, doesn't just keep going. Just keep the team running. Yeah, I know, I know. So uh, they have plenty to say for themselves, uh, which is great. And um, yeah, there's there's so much to talk about. I, I know you were saying earlier on this morning that they were brilliant talking about Kerry and Kerry's attacking unit. And like, they really were. Like David Clifford got the least mention out of all the Kerry forwards. Andy was raving about Darren Moynihan. Paddy was talking about Sean O'Shea, the lack of ego, Killian Spillane. Um, you know, we did a lot on Paul Ganey the week beforehand, but... I, I just think that it's so evident when you're listening to them that that matters so much. Like, like I'd be guilty of, like, I'm sure everyone would be of, of you know, being in love with David Clifford as a footballer and, and how crazy he is and focusing in on that side of things. But when you're at that level of intercounty football, it's the unit around you that matters. It's not necessarily the individual themselves. So that's becoming more and more evident the more, the more that you listen to the lads. And vice versa, they rave about Niall Scully. Niall Scully is the man to talk about for about seven or eight minutes uh, and how Scully has now facilitated the likes of Kieran Kilkenny to play inside in the full forward line. So it's good stuff, again, from Paddy and Andy. We need to find out who is on that five-a-side team in Jamaica. 100%. Letting him yeah. take the penalties. That was mm. a big risk. Yeah, yeah. He, it, what, Paddy, when Paddy was talking about the penalty, I was thinking, did you not take a penalty in an All-Ireland final? But he won a penalty. Um, I don't know whether it was later that year, was it 2017 against Mayo or was it 2016? But Jim McConnelly, Jim McConnelly rattled the back of the net, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He did score the penalty that day. Pretty sure it was 2017. But uh, yeah, I know we, we'll get more stories out of Jamaica, but I think we'll just we'll let Paddy tell them himself. 2017, the year Connolly comes off the bench in the, the All Ireland final. The, um... No, do you know what? It must have been 2016 because Connolly came on for Andrews at half time. I think that, that might be it. Yeah. I, was, I was making the point to Jared there when we were playing the clip that scoring penalties in GEA is harder than in soccer because of the ball. A size 5 O'Neill's is objectively harder from the ground when you're going for the back of the net. Fair enough if you're floating it over the bar. But yeah. from the penalty spot, you want a Premier League football rather than a size 5 O'Neill's, I think. Well, what I would say, Owen, is that since then, I've been 99% sure that the penalty spot has been moved closer to goal. No way. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be pretty sure that since 2016. It happened either around then or uh, or just after it, but it, it is a little closer to take a penalty now. It's too hard. Football. I, I'm not sure what the exact reason was. Now, I've I scored I've scored penalties in Park Talton at under I, 14 I love, level. I love how Tommy... Under, four, under 14 <laughs> level. Always brings us back to... And, and he's there he's there with like the footballer of the year and the 12-time All-Ireland <laughs> champion. Listen. And he's like, listen... When I when I make these runs at Meath Hill now, I, I don't often get the ball that I demand in. Should I be should I be horsing the lad out of it, or should I be putting the arm around him? It's like it's funny how ultimately this is all the education of Tommy Rooney. One hundred percent. Like this is literally our pre-production and post-production calls. Is what should I do in this scenario or that scenario? So, listen, 
uh, hopefully I can retain the number 14 jersey in Mead Hill this summer and uh, <laughs> use what I've learned from the lads. When is the transfer to Clare? When are you signing the papers? Ah, lads, look, there'll be, there'll be no transfer and... It didn't I'd work love out. to tell you. I'd love to give you the reason why. I'd love to give you the reason why. But the, the simple reason is, we had training on Friday night, and uh, I, I was able to make it back up for it. And it was just class, just being back. Uh, it was my first time in my life. I, I don't know if I've told you, but I got my driving license a couple of weeks ago. First time Congrats. in my life that I actually drove to training on my own. And for for the first time in ten years, I didn't have to ask for a lift home from training. And at the end of training, I asked the boys, "Anyone want a lift?" Nobody wanted a lift, obviously, but. Uh, <laughs> It was a it was a big moment for me and it was great to get the slag and, and uh yeah, it was it was good. I don't think I could ever transfer from Meath Hill. It's just that's the club. You could have you could have brought Meath Hill down in a COVID scandal by bringing lads home thankfully, uh, the last day. Thankfully yeah. I did. I, uh, like is this just because you're now looking at the Clare and the county team and realising that they're actually better it's than Meath and the county team and realising <laughs> that Meath is still a better opportunity for you to, to get into county football? I, I don't know, I don't know what I can say about that, but Owen Cleary's point. What a score! What a what score! A score. <laughs> you know, there's about five minutes at the end where Andy Moore starts raving about Paddy Cunningham's left uh, left footed outside of the point score for Antrim. So I think we're going to pick a score of the week every week. Yeah, like we were plan. talking about Morris Fitz this week, but Owen Cleary, like that was just unbelievable. The, a, a brilliant, brilliant camera angle. It, it was a little bit like Connor Sweeney's point that kept tip alive in, in, um, against Limerick last year in the Munster Championship. Yeah. Like There's been some brilliant uh, left sideline scoring over the last couple of years. Well, well, Sweeney's was closer to Morris Fitz. Like, Cleary is on the 13, 21 yard yeah, line. Like, he's height the goal there. I think yeah. the, the very interesting point that Paddy Andrews uh, made about the quality of football that's being played at the moment, the technical proficiency, the foot passing and the hand passing, and how, like, when you compare with the match that we watched, which is only 20 years ago, the absolute escalation in the quality of the football that we're watching. And bear in mind, we're coming off the back of two decades of everybody on TV telling us how shit the football was. Yeah. Bear in mind that all of the analysis was puke football and blanket defence, and this is terrible, but actually what's happened has been a complete revolution in the skills of the game. And, and like, we, we, we've been celebrating it for that period of time. We've been talking about the advances in, in tactics and uh, the technical proficiency, but just not enough of it. Like, there's this 100%. nostalgia for the, the games. And there were brilliant footballers who, if you put them in today's environment and gave them the training and the conditioning and all the leadership advantages that they have, they, they would be able to no doubt hold their own and also be some of the superstars. But the game is brilliant at the moment. Mm. Yeah, Paddy, Paddy starts talking about the Dublin training sessions over the last couple of years and the emphasis that's put on, on skills over the last seven or eight years. I know we don't have any time here, but uh, we actually, like Andy, Andy started saying that it reminded of him of watching Kilkenny sessions 10 years ago. And you'd just be so surprised by how basic it looks from the outside, but it's all just focused on skills. Like when you've heard from Mick Bohan talking about uh, the skills training that he used to do with Dublin and the Dublin ladies footballers in DCU. And it all goes back to that just the amount of kick passing and touches they're getting on the ball and training. Right, subscribe to The Football Pod with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moore and it's available to listen to right now. Get it on the OTB Sports app. Hit subscribe, turn on your notifications and every Wednesday when it goes live around about 6 o'clock we will let you know. Now, uh, news coming through this morning. Stephen Donnelly has told News Talk he is optimistic there will be some fans at the hurling final on the 22nd of August. So, I hope he's right. If only he had some influence over that. If only he knew how to fix things then. Um, but look, that's what he said, and we'll take him at his word, August 22nd, and we'll forget about the trampolines if he can, uh, if he can make that happen. Now, uh, a reminder about what's uh, coming up on OTB Sports Radio a little bit later on. Lance Armstrong interview at 1, the History of Sport lecture series with Paul Rouse. Our retro panel is me, JA's heyday, and the ascent, Barry Ryan's book, is OTB Gold at 6. Sue Murphy is with us for our TV pick. Sue, good morning to you. How are you? Not too bad, surviving. <laughs> what um, what are we looking at this week? Um, just I just wanted to briefly talk about Woman in the Window uh, because it's on Netflix at the moment. Um, there was so much written about this film in the last year. It was meant to be released in March 2020. It got pushed back quite a few times because of COVID. It was on a Disney release schedule. It got taken off it. It was meant to get a theatrical release. 
there were problems in edit. It just it just slowly starts to unravel. And what's really weird about it is the, the talk around this film was that this was going to be the worst film that it had ever hit a screen anywhere. Right. And I've wow. seen some of them. <laughs> And I watch this and I don't know if it, you know when you hear so much in the media about a film that it's either brilliant, it's the greatest thing you've ever seen in your life and you get it and you're like, yeah, it's grand. Or it's the worst film that's ever come out. And then you watch it and you're like, that wasn't so bad. It, that's where this kind of sits. It is a mess. Don't get me wrong. It's a bit all over the place. But it's definitely not the worst thing I've ever seen. Like I sat in the cinema and watched Speed Racer and that is probably the worst cinema experience I've ever had in my life. So it's not as bad as that. <laughs> but it is, like, I don't know if you've read the book. I read the book and the book is very complicated. And when they brought it to the screen, they really tried to bring everything that was in the book onto the screen, which is just impossible. It's really hard to ask. So Amy Adams is pretty good in it. Uh, it's just, I don't think it's as bad as everyone was saying. Gary Oldman's in it, Julianne Moore, yeah. Jennifer Jason yeah. Lee. It's got a great cast. Um, it yeah. sounds, from what you're saying, like this is the type of thing that would have been a good limited series, three to five episodes. Yeah, absolutely. They, they might have been able to get everything in. And that's, it's mad that books that are complicated are being distilled into 90 minutes or two hours or however I maybe this is too long and that might be one of the issues or maybe it's, it's not two long hours enough. actually so um i did actually pause it and take a break and come back at one stage in the middle of like a fight sequence and i was like maybe it's not keeping me as engaged as i thought it would but no it's 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 really i just think the media tends to jump on things like this and and rip them apart and then it's actually not as bad as you think it's going to be but i think anyone who read the book would be slightly disappointed because the book is really like the mystery in the book is actually really well written so that's the only downside i'd say uh, I, I i haven't seen and won't see wild mountain time but i suspect that the media got that right in that case did they yeah, i think i actually haven't seen it yet and I, like, i've seen large sections of it at this stage but uh, from what i've read from people i would trust on reviews yeah it wasn't it wasn't that great they were really offended about that though the cast were like really offended that people were so annoyed about this I mean, yeah. god yeah. forbid they were convinced Attention. they did a good job like, sorry, what's what's the story with Amy Adams being in terrible movies? Like, uh, for a phenomenal actor, she tends to show up in a lot of things that get widely slammed. I I think it's because of the appeal of who's working on it. Like, Joe Wright directed this. Joe Wright worked on Atonement, which is a really good. Like, he's a good director, and your cast is brilliant. It's Julianne Moore, Gary Oldman, Jennifer Jason Lee. There are a lot of people involved in this that if you read the script, you knew the book. And it's a good performance for her. Like a lot of this film is her in the house having this nervous breakdown. So there's a lot like there's a lot of meat in that for an actor. But I just, it just didn't turn out like this strikes me as something when they were shooting it. They might not have seen how bad it was getting until they got into an edit suite and went, oh my God, how are we going to piece this all together? Because it's it's just, that's the problem with it. It's a mess. Uh, I liked Sharp Objects. I kind of thought the end was yeah. a bit of a whip crack. Um, I loved the end. I mean, I, you can never go back to it though. That's the thing with stuff like that. So it's just, and look, a lot of people don't ever want to go back to stuff. So it, it, doesn't, it didn't live with me for very long, I would say. I don't know, what are the bad movies you're talking about on that she's been in? Uh, was it Leap Year? Leap Day? Was that the, the name oh of the, the movie? That were, like, I mean, that is the Wild Mountain Time prequel. Like, there has to be some sort of theory out there that links the two of them and they're actually the same movie, to be quite honest with you. It's just absolutely horrific. I'm actually looking at it. her worst rated movie ever. I haven't seen this. It's Serving Sarah, which has a 4% score on uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Have you seen it? No, I haven't seen it. 4%? Uh, the Not Wedding good. Day, 2005, 11%. And she plays the voice of Polly in Underdog, uh, which uh, I have seen, and it is awful, even even as a child when you're watching that. Although I was probably, I was probably a teenager, actually. Um, for, well, like, I mean, that's... Uh, what I'm saying is that she's been in excellent, excellent movies, and then in the middle of all these excellent movies, she tends to show up in something that's absolutely horrific, which is no fault of her own. I wonder, is it... Um, maybe the agent or... <laughs> it kind of is. You, you got, you're responsible for your own choices there, you know? Yeah. Uh, and she's a great actress. I think she's just enticed by the people working on it and the scripts and it looks good. And then you're in the process and you're like, oh God, this is going to be terrible. Like, everything about this should have worked. It just didn't. Halston on Netflix is the next thing we're talking about. Yeah, I'm slightly obsessed with this. I don't know if it's going to be everyone's cup of tea. It's five episodes. Um, Ewan McGregor stars as Alston, Halston, who's the American fashion designer of 70s and 80s. Um, had a... 
a kind of a complicated life. It, I love watching these things because you know when somebody's putting a business together and they're just like, yeah, I don't have any money, but I'll figure it out. And you're just like, how do you do that? <laughs> how is that possible? And this guy just builds an empire out of nothing. I mean, he was basically bankrupt at the start. And his he knew where to hit in New York society, like who he had to get his dresses on, who he had to get his coats on, how he was going to build his empire. And he's a visionary. It's just really like, it's a really interesting look at Halston. There is a part of this that I think will only be interesting to interesting to people who are into fashion and design and that, but there are really good performances in it as well. Like Uma McGregor is practically in every single scene in this and he's really, really good. Like the accent he puts on, uh, his costumes, how he really embodies Halston. I think it's kind of a, I'll go straight on to the next episode and I'll watch the next episode. I've, I'm on the third now already and I, like, I didn't even realize I was on the third. I was like, oh no, I want to see what happens. So this is a, so, a biopic true story of a guy yeah. who lived and died uh, and made lots of money, I presume? Tons of money, but then lost a lot of that money as well. So they, they get to that and he just, like, there's a few times in the first couple of episodes where he's like, I'm not good at mum numbers. I just like design dresses. And he really isn't like, he's not, he's not just saying that he goes, you know, somebody at one stage says, you really have to stop buying orchids. And he's like, they inspire me. They help me design. And he just has no idea how to look after money. And they really get that across, but an amazing designer, but a great story. Like, Ewan McGregor was absolutely loving playing this character. Okay, the other thing you wanted to talk about was Back to Barrytown. Yeah, it's just, I watched this on Sunday and it's on the RT player as well. The first episode was The Commitments. Um, the Snapper is the next one and The Van will be the last one. And it's a really nice, nostalgic look. Like, I don't think you're going to learn a massive amount from these. I think they're so part of, it's particularly Dublin society, but also Irish. Like, it's just so Irish. And Roddy Doyle and... Colomini sitting in a pub drinking Guinness with the videotapes watching this for the first episode and it's actually just a really nice look at the films. So it's Gogglebox I, except with Colomini and Roddy Doyle. Exactly and they're just talking about their experiences. Now there are a few like it's kind of like why isn't Andrew Strong in this? He was the lead singer in The Commitments. There was Alan Parker was the director who came on board. Glenn Hansard wasn't very fond of him and says a couple of things that aren't that nice. Roddy Doyle was left off the uh, a credit for the script, even though he'd written all the characters and written most of the script, but they got someone in to polish it up and suddenly he's out. So you're kind of like, oh, it's not as uh, it's not as amazing as I thought this was going to be. This is a kind of a bad experience for a couple of people involved. So they are quite honest about it. But then they were all, um, the actors were all pissed off that they were left off the Late Late Show on Friday night yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. And I think there is a, like, why? Why would you, especially when they're, like, a lot of those are touring. They've been touring for years. They've played Vegas. They're a band. It, it doesn't make sense why you would leave them off. Like, Andrew Strong has only played with them once, but he played a reunion concert, so it didn't really make any sense. But, um, no, it, this is just, like, if you, like, I think with The Snapper is one of those films that just comes out and you're just like, oh, I'll watch this uh, from whatever point it's at. Colin Meany is great in it, and he's a great narrator for this. The books are sensational. Everybody should just go back and reread the books again because yeah. they are they are legitimately sensational. It, it's high high art specific to Ireland, and we should be proud of that. What's old that you're watching at the moment? The Sinner. The Sinner. I actually, uh, when I was on maternity leave, flew through this. Um, it was just <laughs> something to have in the background that, like, every now and again, I didn't have to get too invested into. But it's it's uh, Harry Ambrose is the director. Dir er, is the detective in it, sorry. And it's kind of this idea where the Cora is the first one. There's a different case in every single series. In the first series, it's a woman called Cora who stabs somebody in the beach inexplicably and can't remember what happened. And the ten, the eight episodes kind of reveal what had happened to her in her past. It sounds like it's just like everything else, but do you know what? It was something that I went straight onto the next episode for. It's very binge watchy. And surprisingly, Jessica Beale is actually really good as Cora in this. Um, Bill Pullman plays the real like, oh, I'm so washed up and I'm a detective and I've lost my family and I have a drink problem and the usual kind of stuff, but he's good at it and he looks good. So yeah, I just think if you're looking for something that's like not too much investment, but is a good binge watch, it's 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 a good idea. Yeah, totally fine. I only watched season one, never watched, went to see season two. Is it any good? Yeah, I liked season two. It's it, not as good as season one. I thought season one was actually really well put together, but it's still it's still fine. It's still something you could definitely spend some time with, you know? Okay, and the update is Mayor of Easttown still going. This is week by week, is it? I'm obsessed with this. I'm on season, or I'm on episode three now, and it's just, do you know when you're watching something and you're like, I can't wait, not only for the next episode, for the next scene. I can't wait to see what happens in the rest of this episode. There's one scene in the second episode where Kate Winslet is explaining what happened to her son. And if it was in a film, she'd win an Oscar for it. It is 
incredible performance. And it's just, they really have invested in building out all the characters. And it was slowly tipping along for the first two episodes. And the end of the first sec- the second episode, it just flies. It just starts to take off. And I, I'm devouring it. It's week by week release, yeah, on Sky. And it's so, 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 so good. Grim. Really how many, grim. How many episodes? Good. There are eight episodes in this altogether. I think there are five that are up in the player now at the moment. Okay. So another, yeah. another three weeks for those of us who uh, might binge it to go. <laughs> well worth your time. Like, right. well worth your time. Oh, and have you got any <laughs> updates? No, no, I really don't. I really don't. I Like, I haven't even... Ma- I actually got to the stage where I watched half an episode of Married at First Sight a couple of weeks ago, and then I just stopped. Uh, and I did manage to watch a full episode of The Wire last week, but that's kind of where I'm at, where I'm getting through half episodes of things, and then I'm, other stuff pops up. And Too much football. They, can the country just shut down again, please? We'll, uh, we'll stage an intervention, don't worry. Sue, good stuff. Thanks very much. Sue's picture Thanks, available on the otbsports.com website, and uh, you can obviously get them every Thursday here on OTBAM, which is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Adrian and Owen are going to be back tomorrow from half seven with Friday's OTBAM. Alan Quinlan on the Champions Cup final, talking Gaelic football and much more as well. Up next, though, Philippe Clare is going to talk about the return of Karim Benzema to the French squad. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Alison scores! Unbelievable! The goalkeeper has scored! Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? If not, here's some of what you've missed over the last week. Would he be better at Manchester United than Solskjaer? Well, I'm only giving you my opinion. I, I believe so, yes. And he picked the ball up and threw it. Now, I didn't see the first one. I think David Kemp, who's my assistant, came over to me and just said, Tone, have you seen well, how Rory throws this ball? <laughs> Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. At Online Tradesmen, we've never been busier. And if you're a trade professional, there's never been a better time to join us. Access over 17 million euro worth of jobs nationwide every month, along with e-learning and other supports. Need a website for your business? It's included in your membership. And on average, Online Tradesmen members get up to 10 times their fee back in new sales, marketing tools and savings. Apply today at onlinetradesmen.ie. Online Tradesmen, the home of qualified trade professionals. OTB AM With Gillette Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors So uh, Kareem Benzema last night dramatically named in France's Euro 2020 squad after an absence of about six years hasn't played for the country since uh, late 2015 as a result of his alleged and he denies it but alleged uh, association with an attempted blackmail case involving his former teammate Matthew Valbuena. So this has lingered on and been a huge point of contention over the last six years, as you might imagine. In January of this year, French prosecutors announced that Benzema would be facing trial later on this year in October. And yet on the eve of Euro 2020, there's been a fairly serious about turn on Didier Deschamps' part. He's been pretty consistent on this issue right the way through. So, therefore, I started with Philippe Clare and asked him how surprised was he at the announcement last night? Um, very surprised. <laughs> Nobody had seen it coming. There hadn't been any leaks, uh, be it from the uh, the players' camp or from the editions camp or the French Federation. There were no indications that this would be the case. And I think when we heard the story to start with uh, from L'Equipe and the Parisien uh, on the evening, uh, on the eve, of the announcement, we all thought, hmm, not too sure about this one. Uh, I'll believe it when I see it. And um, we saw it, and now we believe it. Uh, uh, We struggle to believe it, but we believe it now. It was a huge surprise for absolutely everybody. Why do you think Deschamps has changed his mind here? I think there are a number of factors. Um, there is, of course, the sporting factor, the fact that France hasn't been necessarily that convincing, particularly um, in the uh, attacking uh, side of it, of their game over the last few qualifiers in particular. I mean, the games against uh, uh, Ukraine, against uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina and uh, Kazakhstan, it was, um, were not exactly convincing. And there was a sense uh, or a feeling that France was missing something or someone up front um, and that it made sense to have back in the team 
one of the world's greatest number nines. And of, of that, there is absolutely no doubt. He's having an absolutely magnificent season at the age of 33. He's probably he's never been as good as he is right now in a team that is fundamentally dysfunctional. Uh, he makes it look uh, as if this team is not. And so, so there is a, a sporting argument which is totally um, un- incontroversible. Um, there is also, I think, an amount of certain amount of pressure, perhaps from above. Uh, it's no secret that people at the French FA have wanted uh, Didier Deschamps to bring Karim Benzema back into the national team for a while. Gentle pressure, perhaps, but pressure nonetheless, um, and and perhaps uh, a need for all the parties involved, that includes the player and the manager, to sweep the matter uh, under the carpet once and for all, because it's, it's really been poisoning their lives for so long now, since, well, 2016, really, basically, mm. uh, since all the, the facts came to, to light, or the, the facts or the allegations came to light. Despite the fact, as, as you said, uh, the trial is set to uh, take place in October 2021. But I think all these factors combined uh, to make the additions decision more understandable, if not less surprising. Mm. And do we know, for instance, have the French FA always been of the opinion that Benzema should be included in the squad or if they changed their opinion on the situation? Um, I think Noël Legrette, uh, who's been re-elected president of the French FA, who is pretty much the man who decides everything in the French FA, has been pretty clear in private, if not in public, that um, he would be very happy if Karim Benzema rejoined the, the French national team for quite a while. Okay. And uh, Didier Deschamps has actually you know, uh, accepted the fact that there, there have been a number of discussions with Le Gret, uh in the recent past about it. So this has dragged on a long time, uh, to say the least, a number of years now. And as you said, we're only getting to trial stage this October. You used the phrase there that it's poisoned the uh, various lives yeah. so just to re-familiarize yourself with the situation and you can correct any mistakes i make here because i'm sure things have been lost through trans- translation over the years so benzema in effect he's alleged back in 2015 of having pressurized his former national teammate to deal with the blackmailers uh, the blackmailers threatened to reveal an intimate video in which Valbuena had featured on a camera phone and in effect, uh, Benzema uh, was approached by a childhood friend that year as the accusation to act as an intermediary and to convince Valbuena that the best thing to do was deal directly with them, I presume pay the ransom. Instead, Valbuena went straight to the police as opposed to taking that advice. And a number of other people will stand mm. trial in the case. Benzema has denied any wrongdoing. He reacted to the trial date now being said on Instagram earlier this year by posting, yes, finally, let's go. Let the masquerade end forever. So broadly speaking, is that a pretty good summary of what Benzema is accused of doing? I think it's a pretty decent summary. I mean, we can't go too much into detail because this is sub judice and we have a, a trial. Loads of things have been leaked to the press in France, okay. including the transcripts of uh, discussions that uh, Karim Benzema had with uh, Juste Instruction, basically the, the coroner in charge of um, uh, the investigation. Um, I, I have. I can't really say much on that. You, you know. I mean, we've talked together about this before. Yeah. It, it is. A, it is a judicial matter. So I think we've got to be very careful about what we say. But what you have said, I think, is a pretty good and fair summing up of what we have in in, in front of us mm. uh, at the moment and what has been poisoning the atmosphere for a very long time. Uh, but in a way, you know, it's not the affair itself which has poisoned the atmosphere. It's what's happened after the consequences, the effects, the aftershock of the affair. That's what really has poisoned uh, the atmosphere uh, in the French camp and beyond. So if we go beyond then into society, I mean, Mm -hmm. I know the French, was it president or prime minister came out at the time and said Benzema had no place in the French squad when these allegations emerged. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Is it possible to measure what the French public at large thought about the situation? Very delicate. <laughs> I'm walking on eggshells here. Um, yes, I think people felt very strongly at the time about it. I think people still feel very strongly in some some parts at the moment. I think more importantly, 
um, the news has been welcomed by almost everybody I've spoken to. Um, because this has really gone way, way beyond um, a simple, well, a simple, it's not simple, it's pretty serious stuff, but a problem um, of behavior, of uh, misbehavior, whatever you want to call mm. it, of, of a few individuals. We have to remember that um, there was this also inflammatory, and I think there's no other word for it, interview that Karim Benzema gave to Marca uh, in Spain. Uh, in which he questioned the decision of Didier Deschamps to take him out of the French national team, saying that he had given up to the racist element in France. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that. And we have to remember as well that um, Didier Deschamps also took Mathieu Valbuena, who was the victim, out of the French national team at the time, for reasons which I think everybody could understand. Now, I'm not sure that Karim Benzema, who is, by all intents and purposes, uh, uh, I would say a good guy, is that all right to say that? I mean, I don't think mean to be condescending. He's considered to be a really good chap, actually. Okay. Um, he might have been naive. Uh, the expression was certainly not the most felicitous. And as a reaction to that, uh, Didier Deschamps' house in Concarneau was vandalized. And um, some graffiti were tagged on the wall outside, racist and so forth. So you can imagine how Didier Deschamps felt about that. Mm. So, uh, and, and it's basically, it exploded way beyond what Deschamps, Benzema, Valbuena, everybody thought would happen. And, and it took on distinctly toxic, poisonous connotations. Okay. Um, and which is why so, so many people like me, I'm relieved. I'm not sure it's the right decision, by the way, uh, in terms of, of football, I'm not sure that it's going to work out all right. But like almost everybody else in front, of, I'm relieved mm. um, that uh, we 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 might have turned a corner yeah. in this really sordid affair. And when you say so, this spilled beyond football and a football conversation. And Benzema has made the points he's made about mm. racism and race. So was this on political talk shows, and was this held up as a, an example yeah. of a dysfunctional relationship with race in the country? Was it, uh, you know, going to all these places? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I have to say, it went through. I mean, and the, the way it was exploited by people. Uh, I, I must be honest: is is people on probably from the extreme right as well, the extreme left, uh, was totally distasteful. Okay. And actually, I can still see in in, um, in France, and I'm actually quite disturbed about that. That's a personal opinion, and I, but I'm quite happy to make it, to see that um, people from the extreme right National Front or Rassemblement National, or whatever they're called these days, are being asked for their reactions to the reintegration of Karim Benzema. I find that totally distasteful um, and not serving any particular purpose when I think most French people and certainly almost all football fans I've spoken about spoken to sorry um, are of the opinion that oof, you know we all it starts breathing a sigh of relief and uh, and we're hoping that it's going to be very difficult to have like a complete reconciliation and so forth we shouldn't be you know blind to that but um, it's a decision even if it's been taken for reasons which are reasons of expediency or reasons of personal interest, it's a decision that certainly goes, in, I think, the right way when it comes to healing a very deep wound within French football, which I don't believe either Didier Deschamps or Karim Benzema himself wanted to create in, in the first mm -hmm. instance. They've become hostages of, of a situation which is way beyond them and which is very revealing of the, the fracture lines within French society at the moment. It became a real, you know, a, a cause célèbre, I believe, that you, you could say that. And, for example, somebody like Olivier Giroud, uh, who took over as number nine in the French national team and did very well, by the way, uh, was subjected to all sorts of abuse because he was not carrying Benzema by Benzema defenders. Okay. And on the other hand, there were people whose criticism of Karim Benzema very much had a racial and racialist overtone. Right. So, you know, if you can say goodbye to that, that would be wonderful. And Benzema, generally, Philippe, has, I, I'm wondering if he's had an uneasy relationship with uh, 
portions of the French public uh, even before this issue. I ask because I saw a quote of his from December 2006 with RMC. So Benzema grew up in an eastern suburb of uh, Lyon, but his family very much come from uh, Algeria. So he's of Algerian descent. He said of Algeria, it's my parents' country, it's in my heart, but it's true, I will play in the French team. I will always be present for the French team, but that's more for the sporting side because Algeria is my country. And I think as well, did he draw criticism for those comments, but also for uh, supposed reluctance to sing the national anthem? Has all of that been swirling around with Benzema in advance of even this controversy? Yeah, Michel Platini never sang the French national anthem. Mm. Yeah, that's, you know, that's it. Um, uh, I would say one thing for Karim Benzema as well, when it comes to people who question his uh, loyalty to the country of his birth, France. Um, he's one of the very few footballers I know, French footballers I know, who have made um, a, a big career outside of France and have earned millions to pay tax in his native country. He does. Not everybody does. So I think that kind of patriotism sits quite nicely with me. And I don't think, I think this kind of uh, criticism is totally out of order, mm. to be absolutely honest with you. Um, but it says very much more about the people who make it than the people who are the supposed targets. Yes. So you mentioned the extreme factions of politics and we can yep. guess their views and the Benzema supporters. I mean, I'm sure uh, for you know people of similar descent, for instance, they're right behind them. What about the, the great middle who are you know just looking on and, and trying to make up their minds on this? How, is, it, is it possible to discern where they are in all this and where they are on Benzema? Yeah, whether well, you can imagine in France, it's all been about uh, opinion polls, about what do you think about Karim getting back in the national team? And I think the answer is 86% are in favour. Okay. So I think I've answered your question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, and like, would there be a sense he's, and, and I know we're now getting back into territory where we don't want to comment too much on the case, but that he's been harshly treated, that, you know, like, is Benzema denying that he ever spoke to Valbuena about this? Or is he saying, no, no, yeah, no. look, we, 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 I did talk about this, but I was just giving him some genuinely friendly advice. I wasn't pressurizing him. Do we know what his version of events is? Yes, that's very much on the lines that uh, you, were, you were describing uh, a second ago, so that he talked about Buena, he admitted to it, and um, that he was basically trying to give him advice in a very delicate situation okay. um, and, and, and nothing more than that, and certainly not encouraging him to, uh, to pay money to, to blackmailers. That's, that's the way he's presented it. Um, again, you know, it is very, very, very delicate territory because a lot of what we're talking about here has been leaked yes. to, to French media and honestly should have remained a, a matter for the uh, instruction of the affair, which you know, is going to come to court in October. We'll, we'll know then. We, we can hear what they have to say. But I, Karim Benzema has never denied the fact that he spoke to Mathieu Valbuena about uh, the, the, the famous sex tape. Yes. And uh, what he said exactly... Um, we'll, we'll find out. I mean, there, there are recordings which have been circulating, but I don't think it would be right for us to, to quote from them. Right, OK. Re recordings <laughs> of conversations between Benzema and police or Benzema and Valbuena? Um, Benzema and Valbuena. OK, so I presume France's WhatsApps were hopping. Well, to be absolutely honest, I don't know how the conversations were recorded. Uh, I don't know if the transcripts are correct. Okay. So I'm reserving my judgment on that. But I, I know where I know you're hinting at, and I, I'm like you. I'm a little bit puzzled, yeah. shall we say. And one last thing on this again, because I know we have to be fair to all parties concerned. Has Valbuena spoken on the issue, as in, does he think that Benzema was taking advantage of him and pressurizing him, or does he think Benzema was giving friendly advice, but the prosecutors disagree? Where is Matthew Valbuena on this situation, do we know? Um, to be honest, I, I I don't know if Matthew Valbuena has changed his position from what I, I read and heard from him at the time, but uh, he was not too happy about the role that his uh, French teammate had played okay. in the whole affair. Right, that's okay. the way I would put it. Okay. I, I mean, we're all probably more familiar with Benzema's career. What effect has it had on Matthew Valbuena, the whole episode? Well, um, I think that it, well, certainly as far as this career in the French national team, that was it. And and then uh, he went to Olympiacos. And to be honest, he was fantastic with Olympiacos. I do remember seeing him uh, at the Emirates playing against Arsenal and running, um, you know, I mean, he 
Mathieu is, I can't remember his age now, but he's, you know, he's not a young, not a young man anymore, not a young footballer anymore. Mm. Uh, but he was running rings around uh, Arsenal on, on that night. So uh, I, it certainly has hurt Mathieu Valbuena's career a great deal, his image, his reputation. He's, he's the genuine victim of that. Mm. Uh, because, by the way, without going into details, the so-called sex tape is really nothing that you should be ashamed about. So... There you go. Right. He's the victim in the whole in the whole story. So why we should his forget that? And French thank you career. for reminding us of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Why did his French career end? I don't really get that. Well, I mean, because uh, Didier Deschamps basically said, you know, it was impossible to to have either of the players in the team because of what it would mean for the atmosphere within the camp. You know, so they were both like, guys, take a breather. We. Mm you have to get out of this. And Valbuena was already, I wouldn't say it was on the way out, but he he certainly was in the latter stage, perhaps, of his international career. And then also he has this problem that most people of his generation has, is that the guys coming behind them are very, very good indeed, and that uh, there isn't much, much space left for a creative uh, midfielder in that particular team. If you look at the 26 that Didier Deschamps selected, uh, you'll see the competition is pretty fierce. There are probably a few names which aren't there. You think, uh, I can understand that. So, you know, Mathieu Valbuena was perhaps not in the same situation. He was not. Karim Benzema was, we knew that, mm. uh, the best number nine uh, of of his generation, of the so-called 88, 87 uh, generation. Mathieu Valbuena was a very fine player, a very creative midfielder, a, a kind of... Um, wonderful you know jack-in-the-box kind of player absolutely loved him wonderful touch and so forth mm. but perhaps you know he didn't have quite the same aura and 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 the same influence that uh, karen benzema had but you know i mean it's not as if much of Albuena hasn't been cast aside um you know in the kind of furnace because of, of what happened there was an immediate decision that had to be taken but he did a show he took it and much of Albuena was a victim of it yeah. And then he was a victim of the fact that France has got um, a great many very, very fine players in, the, in his position. Philippe, I've read a few pieces saying that throughout his tenure, Deschamps has prized harmony in the squad and prized uh, good feel in the squad. And look, we saw the World Cup in South Africa, Les need reminding that thing, when things go wrong in a French camp, they can go uh, very wrong. So this uh, represents, I presume, some kind of risk on Deschamps' part and a break with how he is conducted his tenure thus far when it comes to really prioritizing harmony within the squad you've got to presume maybe he's he's taken the temperature in the dressing room uh, like yeah. this this seems like a big old risk ahead of a major tournament where they're going to be boxed up together yeah i agree with you and that's where my doubts lie uh, because he hasn't right. uh, taken the temperature of the dressing room he hasn't talked to any of the senior players you can bet that he had if he had spoken to any of the senior players uh, before going to see Karim Benzema apparently in April and having this long conversation with him and then all the tractations which followed, uh, the news would have filtered almost, you know, uh, you wouldn't have, you couldn't have avoided it. You know, agents would have spoken, the brother would have spoken, the cousin, whatever, the girlfriend, the boyfriend. Every, you know, it, it's, uh, it would have happened. It mm -hmm. didn't happen because they genuinely kept it to themselves. So the players, it, it came to them as a surprise just as much as it came to us when we when we heard the news. Um, so there is an element of danger because Didier Deschamps uh, is very much somebody who was molded in the Aimé Jacquet mold, uh, apologies for the repetition, but of a team that is first and foremost a group of people, group of men who are all, uh, you know, in agreement about um, the same objective, mm. what Emile Jacquet called a commando. And that's very much uh, what Deschamps is like, which explains, by the way, why you will have, and it will surprise a few Tottenham fans, that Momo Sissoko is, is there. And you think, hmm, didn't have a great season. Yes, but he's been an absolutely amazing teammate and a great dressing room man mm. uh, for, for Didier Deschamps. So and he's very loyal. So, and, and Benzema is not necessarily unanimously liked or loved within that dressing room, the current dressing room. So they will have uh, a few things to, to sort out. And, um, but the work starts now. It's very close to the start of the competition, I must say. 
And I, I have to say that I think the disruption could be perhaps bigger than Deschamps and, and Benzema and everybody else think it, it is. I hope not. Of course not. But it, it is a, a change in attitude. Uh, the tune, the tonality has changed. Mm. It, it, it's not quite the same. You know, Deschamps was very much in, in, in the logic of a certain type of uh, team spirit and team building that he had inherited from Jacquet and Le Maire, and which went missing after Jacquet and Le Maire went away, and that is brought back, and with huge success. And it is a gamble, and I think that beyond the satisfaction, and I think the relief that everybody feels, there, there is an interrogation, which is whether this um, coming back uh, there's a homecoming of Karim Benzema, uh, which makes sense in so many ways, could not also be quite disruptive when it comes to the preparation for the Euro. And that, you know, honestly, and that I know that's a bit of a cop out, but mm. only the competition will tell. You know, it's not because you've got um, Kylian Mbappe, Antoine Griezmann, and, and Karim Benzema as a front three, which, you know, on paper, you think, my goodness, mm. this is crazy. It's not because of that that France is is bound to be successful. Um, and I was thinking about it earlier today. I was thinking about uh, the 2002 World Cup when France uh, arrived at the tournament with the top scorer in uh, La Ligue, uh, in Serie A, the top scorer in Ligue 1, the top scorer in the Premier League, and still went out in the group phase. So. There's no insurance against failure, especially in the kind of group that France finds itself in, which is absolutely, to be honest, it's the worst one you could mm. possibly have drawn for them. Um, but, you know, we, we shall see. There, there is an element, uh, it, it is a bit of a risk. And when, you know, listening to Didier Deschamps, when you talk to my colleagues on, on M6, announcing the team and talking about Benzema uh, yesterday, I, I felt that there was in his voice a, a, a part of, you know, he was... I want to say he was preempting anything. More that he was asking the question, he's still asking himself the question, you know, I've taken a decision, it's my decision, um, but I'll have to live with it. And I know there's a part of risk of it. It was not at all triumphant at, you know, it, it was not, oh, we've, you know, we've soothed um, all, all, we've calmed the waters, uh, everything is fine between him and me now. It was none of that. There was mm. none of that. It was more... We took a decision, I took a decision, a long, hard look. I discussed it with my very close uh, friends within the staff. We decided that uh, this was the thing to do. Didn't go into details. Um, that leads me to believe that uh, for Deschamps, it is you know, something he had to swallow. Uh, in French, we said to swallow, uh, swallow a snake. <laughs> Wow. Um, Amazingly interesting. I think interesting. you had to swallow yeah. a rather, rather large one for this one. I, I do don't you? think okay. that, yeah, I, I really do think so. Yes, absolutely. Wow. wow. I mean, it's going to be fascinating to see how it all plays out. It's never dull with France, that's for sure. OTB AM. With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Dad Pod.